I think we've broken 200 uh, attendees, 201, so we may as well jump in, I think. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, and hello, I am Warren Pisanota. I'm a Toronto filmmaker and national president of the Directors Guild of Canada. Uh, right now, I am in Toronto, Ontario, uh, which is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, Wendat peoples, and to many uh, diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to meet and work on these territories, but we are, as we have seen, are all across uh, uh, not just Canada, but uh, in territories uh, everywhere. So I invite all of us as creators of culture to help strengthen our relationship with Indigenous people and uphold the values of collaboration and inclusion in all that we do. <clears throat> I just like to take this opportunity to say that uh, the DGC uh, believes Indigenous narrative sovereignty is incredibly important uh, and vital. And I wanna take this moment to shout out Mary Clements' Bones of Crows it's a feature film and a TV series, uh, and Jennifer Podemski's Little Bird, uh, both look incredible. Keep an eye on them when they come out, please watch. Uh, and just a little bit of housekeeping for the DGC members that are coming in today and this weekend, please check your emails today about the CMF survey. Uh, this is an incredibly important um, um, initiative uh, that the CMF is putting forward. And I ask the time uh, that we all take the time to fill it out uh, mostly to ensure that the definition of CanCon moving forward includes Canadian stories told by and made by Canadians. So thank you for that. Uh, and with that, I declare the DGC National Directors Division Virtual Production Masterclass Weekend open. I thank you, Zach Lepofsky, the chair of the NDD, uh, and Hans Engel and the entire NDD uh, team for coordinating such an amazing weekend with stellar special guests, case studies, and tours. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here today. As we explore the latest technologies and techniques used in virtual production, uh, it creates immersive digital environments for film and television. Uh, and we have this incredible lineup of uh, guest speakers and experts in the field who will share their insights and experiences with us. And we encourage you to, uh, to learn from them, uh, ask questions and uh, learn from each other throughout the workshop. Uh, this is a space for learning, collaboration and innovation. And we hope that you'll leave this workshop feeling inspired and equipped to take on the challenges and op opportunities of virtual production. I also would like to say the opening greeting was written by ChatGPT for me. So the future is here now uh, and it's, it's, it's terrifying and amazing and I can't wait to learn from all of you. So I hand it over to the chair of the National Directors Division, Zach Leposky. Thank you so much, Warren, and uh, our AI overlords um, for this opportunity. Um, going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into our first uh, panel with, with Ivan. Um, but thank you, everyone, so much for coming. We're super excited to have people from all around the world tuning in for this incredible weekend where we're going to dive into every single detail about virtual production. You'll be an expert. You'll be a master after this. So um, excited to have you all here. First, I'm just going to go through the schedule for today and tomorrow to give you a sense of what's coming up. Um, our first panel that we'll be starting with in just a few minutes is sort of an intro into virtual production with uh, our good friend Ivan here, Ivan Hayden. And uh, we'll be just going over sort of the lay of the land of where virtual production is right now, all the different scales of it, um, what it means, what it is, how it's small, how it's big, all that different type of stuff. Ivan will be giving us the lay of the land there. Then uh, at 2.15 Eastern, 11.15 Pacific, we'll be getting a tour of an actual, you know, getting the sense of what is a virtual production stage. Pixamundo, William F. Whites will be uh, giving us that. Lisa Rose Snow, who's the uh, director rep for Ontario and a good friend of mine, will be moderating that conversation. And they'll take us through their LED stage, stage six, that's in Studio uh, City, and offering basically an introduction to LED volume stages, all the different components of the system. You're gonna learn the terminology, see what it looks like, all the details of how it works so that you'll be able to explain it to people uh, and sound like as much of an expert as they are. Uh, then at 3.20 Eastern, 12.30 uh, Pacific, we'll be having a really interesting panel about pre-visualization. Pre now, Dylan Pierce and, uh, and Andy will be moderating a panel all about pre-vis. Now you've probably heard of pre-vis before, but in virtual production pre-vis, 
is sort of an essential part of the process. And you're gonna learn all about how it changes the way we set up production, what the opportunities are that it offers, how to work with a virtual art department. If you've never heard of a virtual art department, you're gonna learn a lot about it. It's a very key part of the whole process, how the virtual art department works with the physical art department. And we're just gonna discuss a huge range of different scales and examples. So that's gonna be extremely interesting uh, panel you're not gonna to wanna to miss. Then at 4.25 uh, Eastern or 1.25 Pacific, we're gonna have a another extremely interesting panel. I'm really interested to hear this one um, on basically communication on a virtual production set. Um, Nancy Bassey, who's an icon in the industry is, is gonna be moderating a talk um, between many different of the kind of leaders within the industry on a really fascinating topic, which is the communication on set when you're doing virtual production. You know, What are the new workflows? How does it all differ from tr traditional production? Um, how does it, you know, when you want to change something that's on the screen, who is the person you go to and ask that to, and who do they then talk to, and the workflows of all of that. So we're going to explore that whole topic, which would be very interesting. Um, just briefly, I'll touch on what we're going to be going over um, tomorrow. Um, we have a case study of a, um, two case studies tomorrow. The first one is for Bucketheads, which is a lower budget um, sci-fi sort of Star Wars fan project that used virtual production to create an incredible vista. We're going to hear about all the highs and lows from that team. Then at 2.15 tomorrow, we're going to meet a whole bunch of the different vendors and studios across all of, it's basically a cross-country checkup of all the vendors in the country uh, talking about uh, their different studios and what they have to offer and, and how you can work with them uh, from small scale all the way to large. Uh, then we're going to have a great panel at 3.20 Eastern about the best uses of virtual production, all the different kind of ranges of how to use it, um, how you can create whole worlds, but you can also use it for nonfiction. You can also use it for just doing car composites, all that type of stuff. It doesn't have to just be sci-fi. And then at the end of the day, at 4.25 Eastern, we're going to have another case study specifically just about car comps, because that's probably one of the, the main areas that most of us are, are going to be using virtual production first in our experiences. So that's what you have to look forward to tomorrow. Tons of stuff. Uh, quickly, I'm going to also talk about how you can interact with us. The whole point of today is that you're going to be asking lots of questions, uh, steering the conversation, hearing about the things that you want to hear about. So please be very vocal. The way that you can um, interact with us is two ways. The first is at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A button. So if you want to ask a question, uh, write it into the Q&A. For example, I'd love a few people to write in right now just to prove that it works, uh, what you're hoping to learn today. Uh, just, and I'll, and we'll be able to see that, that that feature works. So please someone write what they wanna to learn today into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Also, if you're feeling, uh, <laughs> Alan Chu says he's looking to learn a lot, which is great. We'll definitely cover that. Um, the uh, <laughs> And Jonathan's asking if we're gonna learn about Bitcoin. Absolutely not, uh, but great question. Um, all sorts of great questions coming in there. Also, if you wanna ask your, your um, question live, uh, we do this sometimes, often people are a little uh, shy, but if you would like to come on the show and uh, turn on your camera, you can raise your hand with the raise your hand button and uh, we'll bring you on to the screen if there's time and you can ask your question to the panelists with your camera on, which is sometimes nice because we get to see people from all around the world as they are uh, talking. So uh, just a few, The well, we got a lot of questions. Everyone did this very well. People are learn, want, want to learn how much does it all cost, what the workflow is, the previs process and what studios to connect to. We have a panel for each of those. Um, we have a newbie to virtual production that wants to learn everything, uh, wants to learn about the VAD. What is the VAD? That stands for virtual art department. So you're gonna learn a lot more about that on our panel today. Uh, understanding all the different pieces of this. Way too many questions for me to even answer at this moment. So well done, everyone. Um, next, uh, we're gonna play an interstitial before we get into our first panel. Uh, we play these videos, we're going to be playing them throughout sort of between each, each panel. They're just like videos that show a demo of a certain thing. The first interstitial that we're going to show is actually um, a video of the virtual production workshop that we did um, last year. We do these training work master classes, but we also do in-person uh, events uh, where we actually shoot short films and people get to have hands-on experience uh, doing it. And this video, this interstitial shows an example of what those workshops look like um, that we did with Pixamundo uh, last year. Uh, and we just premiered those films in Toronto just a few months ago. Um, so here's the BTS of that. And then we're gonna um, 
dive into talking with Ivan. So play that video, Julian. It's so clear that virtual production is the future of the film industry. A few years ago, I got the chance to see the stage that Mandalorian was shot at, and immediately as director was like, oh boy, we need to get the rest of Canada on board with this. And so very quickly, I got to work at the Directors Guild, trying to make sure that we can train our directors and all the different people that the Guild represents to learn how to use this technology. Virtual Production Academy helped design and host virtual production workshop with DGC. We got to work with eight directors to shoot eight short films with four of our environments. The VPA helped design a crash course that would onboard these directors and DOPs uh, so that they are familiar with the technology and can hit the ground running as fast as they can. Instead of green screen, it becomes real. And it's hard for you to tell where does the physical world ends and the digital begins. And this is crazy. The adjustments for this new technology, you now have an asset on the wall, and the, and the wall wraps around. And it, along with the, the ceiling as well, provide a lot of ambience, and that ambience matches your background. There's so much to love about working in this capacity, because you have latitude to do things you just don't have on set. There's um, efficiencies that come with how you light. And immediacy too. You don't have to wait if there's a visual effects component. It's right there. So as a visual artist, you can see what you're doing in real time. And so often in film, we don't get that. As the cinematographer, your job is to sort of make the set piece that's been built in the foreground merge into the rendered back background that's there. But the big surprise for me was the fact that you do that to a certain point, and then the people behind the scenes, they meet you, and then they start to blend it. Because you might have a thing where the, the ground surface that you have is meeting the back screen, and we've done all we can to make it look like it belongs there, but you go, it still doesn't match. But they have tools where they can then go in and just tweak that part of it and merge it in. So they had a lot of, they had a lot of tricks up their sleeve. Unbelievable excitement, because it's a brand new world. To actually be in it, and learning from day one. There were just so many new things that I could learn. It's like on the one hand for me, early Hollywood days with the backdrop taken to an ultimately incredible new level. So it's, it's a backdrop that is real in every possible way and it fools the eye. So it's really like magic. The same massive, creative, immersive environments that you'd wanted to create all along, now you can actually do it but at the highest quality, real-time fidelity that only could be dreamed of back in the day. Mind-blowing. Just coming in the room right off the top and seeing that huge, I'm calling it a screen even though that's not what it is, just seeing the environment, massive, obviously, and seeing the scope of it. And then at one point I went around back and had a look. What actually makes this thing tick? and it was like peeling back the curtain for Dorothy or the Matrix, one of those things. The world that it creates has such different textures, but at the same time, looks completely real. I was encouraged to experiment and to bring as many different things as I wanted to the table. So I was really curious to test out different textures and different types of textiles and see how they would react with the feedback of the virtual wall. Right now my head is writing ideas already and the things that can be done and I'm thinking of things that I've done in the past and I'm wondering, oh, if I just had this, then I would have, you know, been able to do it this way. So a lot can be done with this, a lot, a lot, a lot. Everything is possible with this technology, everything is possible. This weekend with the DGC, trying to demystify the technology for filmmakers across the board. And right now a lot of this technology is, is used in sort of these top tier productions, which is really fantastic. Uh, of course, William F. White and 
Pixel Mondo have the opportunity to, to supply these big top tier shows, but we wanna make sure everybody can benefit from this technology and, and gets hands on with it and gets experience with it. And that's really what we're, we're doing here this weekend. It was important for Pixel Mondo to get involved with the DGC workshop because it, we needed to demonstrate to the industry and to new filmmakers that virtual production is an accessible tool for all creators and that we had a chance to demonstrate how fun and how truly amazing virtual production can be for a production. Canadian directors have been making their mark on the world for years with their talent and now we are going to be making the mark with our experience in virtual production. We really are at the forefront of this virtual revolution and it is so exciting to be a part of. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so, oh, turn my camera on. Um, we'll be doing more of these in-person workshops uh, throughout the year in different cities across the, uh, the country. I'm just posting a link into the chat. If you'd like to potentially be involved in those in-person workshops, uh, follow that link to a Google form to put in your information and you'll be able to hear more as, as those events roll out across the country. But right now we're gonna head over to our, our opening keynote with uh, Ivan Hayden. Uh, thank you so much, Ivan. I'm going introduce him quickly. Ivan is a Canadian producer who got his start in visual effects in the late 90s. He's got a lot of experience. He's made his career, um, you know, accessing, adopting, and, and creating new technologies, which gives him, you know, 25 years worth of experience with, with production, handling everything from development to delivery. His latest endeavor, uh, PZAJ Media, you have to tell me how to pronounce that, Ivan, uh, where he is has a focus on creating and servicing content anywhere in the world. Super excited to have you, you Ivan. How are you? I'm doing well, Zach. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so we're excited to hear from you. You're going to give us sort of a lay of the land to kick things off here. Um, so I'm going to hand things over to you. And then uh, everyone, please, as you're listening, type questions into the Q&A, and then I'll come back and we'll we'll have a discussion with Ivan to uh, to learn more about the terminology and where things are at. So take it away, Ivan. Awesome. Um, that is so exciting. Every time I watch videos about virtual production, I just get so jazzed at what the opportunities are. But uh, good morning, everybody, uh, or afternoon and evening, as the case may be. Um, I'd like to thank the DGC National and all of the people taking part this weekend. Um, education on the process and the pipeline are key. Uh, the tool is still evolving, but virtual production is the future. Uh, at the least, it's going to become as commonplace as visual effects. And as an old visual effects person, the number of visual effects in my Hallmark movies is absolutely astounding to me. Uh, I never would have thought that VFX would be solving problems so heavily in the lower budget ranges and, and uh, virtual production will be the same. Uh, but virtual production is definitely going to revolutionize how we tell stories. Um, the events that you guys are going to be seeing in the next two days are going to better help prepare uh, you guys to communicate as you look to adapt virtual production into uh, your process or our process as an industry, and communication is absolutely paramount. Um, virtual production is an opportunity for Canadian uh, uh, filmmakers to stand out and stand up in the early days of technological advancements. Uh, I'm excited to see the DGC and, and all of you and, and the virtual production industry groups all coming together. Uh, communication and education um, between us is what's needed for adoption of volume filmmaking. Uh, we're trying to fit like a, a, uh, a shiny new gear into a well-worn and smooth-edged machine. And I mean, let's be honest, we don't like change. <laughs> uh, but this one is going to be like CGI uh, in that it's going to change how we think. So... I'm a Canadian TV producer, and and uh, I think by default that means I live in lower budgets and uh, and have an indie mindset. Um, so I'm going to attempt to fill my time talking with you guys today, uh, talking about from my perspective about why I'm so stoked about virtual production and uh, how I'm thinking about it. Um, so let's start with what this all is. Um, virtual production, it, it's a bit of a catch-all term, right? Uh, in lay terms, it means uh, shooting talent and action in one physical space that is ultimately going to end up being another place, right? Uh, that usually involves CGI of some sort. And when I say avatar, some of you think airbender, uh, you know, bulkhead, arrow tattoos, pixel mundo, biggest volume stage, and, and you'd be right in that. 
but it also means blue aliens, James Cameron, Weta, and green screens. Both avatars are virtual production and both use the same technology, but the approaches are very, very different. So now volume or volume stage or volume studio, I'm sure you guys will hear that all of these terms will kind of become interchangeable. But what I like to do is I like to think as volume or volume stage or volume studio as filling the volume of a stage with another space. Uh, volume requires light wall technology, but what's cool about it is the light. It gives you the base and it cements your actors in the space that's being projected around them. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle is the light wall itself. Uh, they're, I don't know, approximately a half meter LED panels that snap together and they basically make a giant big jumbotron. Uh, they can be flat, curved on rollers, suspended, but basically in simplest terms, it's rear screen projection. And we've been doing it since the black and white days, so don't be scared about it. Uh, what makes this all so cool is the Unreal Game Engine. And what is a game engine? Uh, a game engine is the software that drives the game. It makes it move. To OG gamers, there were two kinds of games. Consoles, computer games. Consoles were 32-bit, 64-bit, but basically computer games had better graphics because of their computational power. As the chips got better, computer game worlds got bigger and more detailed, spreading the gap between the two. Enter the game engine. Uh, in the old days, we called them render engines, uh, and they tipped the balance of power in favor of the smaller, uh, the smaller console. So think of it this way. Uh, if the console, the little box, had to render the whole world, store it in temporary memory as you move through it, just in case you looked over there, they would have had to have been huge. They couldn't have been small. Like we're talking like massive, like Whopper style, huge. Um, and if there's any, I'm not talking about the hamburgers. So if there's any sci-fi nerds, you know, please educate the people, the rest of the people in the chats what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Whopper uh, war games. Uh, but anyway, what the game engine does is it renders to final only where the in-game viewport is looking. It doesn't have to calculate all the other pixels and, and images and, and geometry. So like, trust me, that is huge for graphic quality, world size, game speed, and specifically console size. So now I want you to think about your Xbox or your PC and the game controller. While you're wagging your thumbs around making old people sick, in the game, you're moving a digital camera through a virtual environment in real time. So you can hide behind a tree. It has three-dimensional depth, shadow, lighting, Atmo. Cool. So when we're filming in front of a light wall on a volume stage doing virtual production, our physical camera is umbilical to the brain bar. It's a row of computers that will be somewhere in, in the stage that has artists or technicians running the Unreal Game Engine to drive the images that are on the wall. The umbilical is going to tell Unreal your real world camera's lens, focus, T-stop, like all, all the VFX things so that it can properly display the image on the light wall. So think about that. What that means is your real world camera is now the game controller and it's moving through a three-dimensional real virtual environment. So it has trees, 3D depth, shadows, lighting, and Atmo, everything but the annoying 12-year-old that's trying to kill you repeatedly. So why am I telling you all this? Because virtual production brings video game solutions to the film problems in storytelling. Okay, cool, right? But what does that mean? It means that you can be anywhere in the world, in any world, driving distance from your home. And I'm a Canadian TV producer, you know, default, lower budgets, indie mindset. So what does this mean to me? And why am I so excited about it? Because it means shooting in controllable spaces again, no weather, uh, in-camera comps, less time on editors, more time for composers and sound. No more talking about tennis balls and trying to explain to actors what they're looking at. But most of all, it means scope. My stuff can have bigger scope. No more selling New York, New York City with crap loads of, of stock footage and then I'm shooting my scene into a gray brick wall over the hood of a yellow cab to sell the whole thing. I can be in camera in New York City doing a walk and talk with depth and parallax and lighting inside in Vancouver. 
Now, this takes planning. And right now, not every project is right for a virtual solution. But if planned for, it can work. And you can afford it. This tech in its pieces has been around for 10 or 15 years in games and VFX and other spaces. It's only come together as a sort of like a, a film solution in business in the last five or six years. And this means it's a bit of the Wild West out there. You know, you're going to go into uh, different volume stages and no two are going to look the same. The crew sizes will be different. The services that they offer will be different. There's no standardized tool sets that are industry wide used. And that brings me back to communication. So you need to start talking, which is what we're doing this weekend, to the people doing the work, uh, to the people in the space, getting as much experience as you can on it. But don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions that you can't afford one place or another can't offer you what you want. Reach out and ask. Virtual production can have cost saves, but A to B line item comparisons, it, it shouldn't really be factored or thought of that way. You might save on not needing a Jenny to power circus or you know, save on liaison fees or maybe you save on moves, but there's going to be increases in offsets in other, in other spaces and, and prep time. Volume Solutions is a production and storytelling tool, not budgeting tool. Increasing scope saving money, making your life easier and less painful should be the win. So we've, we've talked about how I look at virtual production volume and walls, but let's talk about what goes on them because this affects schedule and potential budgeting. You have to have what goes on the wall in advance. You can't figure it out on the day or in post. And the last thing anyone wants to do is be rotoing volume footage and spending VFX dollars. It's just... It's throwing good money after bad, and it, it will look bad. You and you know we just can't fire the VFX producer or take it to a new VFX house. It's it's going to be our problem when we're doing it. So it requires lead time, extra prep, communication, and creative solutions. But we have a post schedule. We have location fees. We have move costs. If these shrink, they can offset the front end. We can be talking. <clears throat> we could be talking four weeks, four months, a year. I mean, it, it depends on what your script is, what the environment that you're going to be living in, what your needs for the space are going to be. But you don't need everyone for every day of that time frame. You need them at key milestone points. So it becomes about scheduling. You could poach some days from official, from official prep, uh, space them out over the time of your, your earlier prep. And that's really where the scheduling comes into it. And it can work. It can work for you if you plan for it. So how much lead time? Uh, it, it sort of depends on you know, what we need in front of the wall and what we need on the wall. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some other factors, and again, from my sort of indie Canadian mindset. So in front of the wall, uh, think of it like whatever talents interact with. Uh, if it's needed for foreground parallax or lighting, if it's part of the digital environments set deck that may be needed as real set deck down the road, it needs to be gotten, built, sourced, you know, whatever. But that, that all has to happen in advance. Like any location shoot, it needs scouting. It needs to be built and it needed to be, needs to be tested prior to the day. This is factor one in lead time. Factor two in lead time is what goes on the wall. Uh, in, in lay terms, uh, there's five types of things you're going to put on a wall. Uh, and depending on the volume studio, they may be able to create this for you, or it may involve using a third party. It could be anything from uh, employing a, uh, an array car, uh, indie artists that would work directly specifically for you, going to a game studio that are used to building Unreal environments, or going to a visual effects house that, that do the same things and are used to the production pipeline. Uh, the five types of things that you put onto a screen in an in indie mindset, and I'll, I'll list them from uh, from easiest or cheapest and that require the least of, uh, amount of lead time needed to what are the greatest and, and require the most. So uh, number one is green screen. You could put a green screen on the wall. 
You can shoot VFX work on the volume and it'll give you perfect keys. You can record the camera data and this will exponentially increase your visual effects effect efficacy and, and make it just awesome. Uh, pro tip, uh, if you don't have a full day of driving uh, plates or, or page counts for your volume, you can put VFX work to fill out your day. You don't have to shoot CGI worlds on a light wall. Use the tool to help your schedule and maximize your time on the stage and you know, potentially you can save money. Uh, number two, digital stills, right? This is just like a still image, right? Like translates or backdrops. Yep, totally. Cheap, easy, fast. Um, they totally work if there's not a lot of camera motion or what you're using is a deep BG or something just sort of out a window behind shears and things like that. Uh, yes, you can pre-treat it, uh, do things on the day or, or add motion to clouds, but that's going to up costs and risk during your production time. Uh, the third thing that you can put on the wall, the third sort of general type of thing that you can put on the wall is pre-recorded, pre-edited, and assembled moving footage. Yeah, it you know it can be animation too, but I'm I'm talking from my indie mindset, so I'm not really going to get into that. Uh, for me, this is the driving work all day long, right? It's beautiful reflections, interactive light, fifteen page day counts. I mean, it it's it's great, but it has to be gotten in advance. So there is the lead time that's required. It's not as much as having to build it because you're just getting an image, but. Uh, you know, maybe you could look at drivingplates.com or, you know, you go to a post-production facility or visual effects facility that has some stock stuff that can help you with that sort of thing. Uh, it's it, it's probably the majority of what most of us will be getting into the visual, uh, into the volume stage for, and then we'll be fleshing out the rest of the day with perhaps another senior visual effects. Number four is the two and a half D solution on digital stills. This is where you take the same digital still, but you wanna have some camera motion to it or more than a digital still can handle. You can cut it up on Unreal or use camera projections to cheat depth and it allows you to move the camera somewhat then have some of that parallax. But there's a note here, that's too much motion and it fails. So, uh, 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 think about it like it's you know the movie projector on the screen and you, and you stand in front of it from the point of view of straight of head look, looking at it you can kind of move around a, a, a little bit and you look like you're part of the image and, and the image in the foreground is moving a little bit compared to the image in the background um, but like if you move the point of view too far then you see the shadow behind it and the image is blown it, it, it's that kind of thing it's two and a half d you can cheat it but you'll break it if you try to treat it like it's a three-dimensional immersive object. So now come to number five. Uh, this is the big daddy. This is why we're all talking about virtual production. This is true virtual and volume stuff. This is a fully CGI created environment that has depth and texture and you know interaction, uh, Atmo, lighting. It's sexy, but it needs time uh, to create, build, test, shoot get all of the pieces that are going to go in front of the wall and on the wall um so there there are some things that you can look at for your schedule like you could go to the unreal marketplace there's there's pre-built stuff there uh it might lower the cost it might shorten your lead time but it has to be fixed to use there, there's no out of the box solution there and sometimes that can be more trouble than it's worth now, some of the volume studios that you go may have existing environments that they have built. They know how to manipulate, they've optimized them, and that is a great option. Uh, but, uh, you know, usually environments are sort of story specific, so it might be hard to adapt them, but, you know, it, it is an option and it should be something that is discussed. Uh, so, if we're not talking about those and we're talking about building an environment from scratch, designing something in CG and making it go so that it works on your wall. I mean, it can cost anywhere from, pick a number, $6,000 to $250,000, depending on the needs for the scene, uh, your budget and your lead time. But what this gives you is alien worlds, period, today, and global locations at home. And, and it's amazing. It's like the video that you just saw of the behind the scenes stuff. It, 
it, it's going to revolutionize or it is revolutionizing how we are going to be telling stories and the the doors that it's going to open in our storytelling we're only beginning to comprehend right now but if you're looking for number four or number five you can't start talking about going virtual on day one of traditional prep I mean you can but you shouldn't the studios will bend over backwards to help you no matter what but you know start talking to the studios now um, there are sort of, there, there's a broad range of, of studios out there from, from the, the bigger OG places that can apply solutions from big budget film problems into lower budget spaces. Uh, typically they're soup to nuts solutions, uh, or can handle any sort of silo therein. So they can do anything from concepts to, to creation of the environments, to just doing the production or even helping in post with visual effects and, and you know, the sky's the limit on what they're able to do. They they may cost more, but you get there faster with slicker options. And and it's, uh, you know, they are willing to work with you. So don't just discount them. Uh, then there's the mid-range uh, volume studios or smaller range volume studios. And even people who have just bought the wall uh, that you can use, but they provide the space and or the wall. They provide you the tech to display what goes on the wall. In some cases, they can uh, offer limited creation or, or capture options, uh, but usually it's going to involve a third party to, to create or develop what goes on the wall. Now, what these people you know, may lack in the backup from, from the bigger places, uh, in, you know, comparatively speaking, is you know, the willingness, the passion, and the potential for collaborative options. Now, Indie Tip. This is just a general sort of thing about virtual as we look to approach what we're doing. Uh, everyone is going to talk about the amazing interactive changeability on the fly, which is part of what makes virtual production so amazing it's the full depth of options and they certainly should be considered but as filmmakers we should know that changes on the day in any location equal time right virtual is no different the bigger the place the more likely the impacts uh, will be smaller but you know still changes on the day equal time uh, like, you know, when I think about my Hallmark movies, when we show up on a location and the leaves have fallen off the tree and there's a big, ugly sign behind it, I, I kind of have three options on what to do with it. Uh, if, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm being a responsible filmmaker, I either live with it. Uh, I try to hide it with set deck in the foreground or, or greens or something like that, or I frame it out. I don't send my set deck with my grips or, or, or transpo guys to go help everybody move a sign off of a building on the day. You, just, you don't do that. So here's a pro tip. Prep what you want to shoot and shoot what you prep, period. You prep magic hour, shoot it all day long. Someone gets the good idea that the sun might be setting, expect it to cost time. But the ability to change sets, move lighting, immerse in other worlds, in a stage, on the fly, in camera, virtual production is future now. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be those people who did that thing with how much and where. And I'm a Canadian TV producer, default lower budgets in any mindset. But I believe virtual production is possible on my timelines and my budgets. I am personally developing content for vir full virtual production, but I have it in mind whenever a script lands on my desk or I help develop it or I'm being consulted for post. The time to plan for virtual is early. Communication is key. The volume studios, as evident by their their they're standing up and being here beside the DGC, taking part in this. They want to work with us. They want things made on their technology, and they will help you how to figure out to apply it to your project, no matter the budget. So start talking now and become the engine that drives virtual production forward in Canada.
the rising tide floats all boats and we are can do's. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your time and I'll pass it back to, to Zach who will present, uh, we'll have a little bit of a, um, a Q and A. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ivan. That was a really great overview of, of all the different, uh, I think hopefully that shows people that there's a really big wide range of what virtual production means. So we're gonna dive into a chat now for about half an hour. So please post your questions into the Q and A, raise your hand if you wanna come onto the show and show your face and ask a question in person. Um, we have a few questions that have been pop popping in. One just sort of building on what you're saying, you know, you're budgeting these different shows that you're working on and you see projects come in. Uh, Jamie Hodgins was asking, how, is there a tool you're using to kind of do a cost analysis of, of like the savings and offsets versus the costs and and things, you know, how do you how do you balance it out? Are you just doing that in a spreadsheet? Is there some way of figuring that out that other people can use? Uh, it, it's actually a, a question that I heard uh, and I've had virtual production companies call me and go, hey, look, there's a production that's asking me to help them budget their shoot on virtual space. Um, and maybe it's because of my visual effects background, I don't know, but the truth of the, no, there is no tool. Short answer is there, there's no tool. There's no, uh, because every studio is different, has a different approach, has a different resources and tool sets and skill sets and those sorts of things. There's no, if I go here, it costs this. If I go there, it costs that. They really are, talk to them. They're willing to work with you. But the truth of the matter is everybody PMs out there, if you're listening, you already know how to budget this. You guys, if if it wasn't a wall and it was on a green screen stage, you would know what you're saving. Now, the offsets on things like it, it, it there, there's the column A and column B where you can slide money from one to cover the money from the other. So if, for example, you have to go to a location that costs you $10,000 a day in a location fee, $1,500 in permits, $2,000 parking, you got liaisons, you got to put the owners up in the house, you got to do cleaning, you got to do all of those sorts of things, that money can come out and go into the building and the creation of it, right? So you, we already know how to do it. And, and I think um, in the interest of communication, it might be best to talk to your visual effects production house and go, hey, if I do this, can I save on that? So if you're going to go with like a big studio that has, you know, uh, cast rooms and makeup rooms and everything in room, maybe you don't need your circus. Maybe you don't need star trailers. Maybe you don't need stuff. But we already know how to look at this sort of thing and what the volume people, like the bigger the bigger sort of Cadillac version of, of volume studios will be able to help you more with that than the smaller ones. They'll have more services, but they, their job is to tell you they're a studio. You come here. I can tell you what it costs to use my stuff and to put the stuff on the wall, right? How many cameras, how much crew it's hard to figure that out. Believe me, guys, we know how to do it once we start thinking about it. So don't be, don't be scared. Yeah. I mean, it's also sort of like if you imagine you were to budget going into a green screen cove, yep. you know, you would be able to kind of break down costs in your mind of sort of comping in that environment. Also, a lot of the vendors that I've talked to and work with, they generally can come to you with sort of a day cost of how a, a ballpark figure for how much sort of the floor is for renting their studio for a day. Yep. Um, and they can probably, there's a question in here from uh, Virginia about basically like how much does it cost to create these environments? I think that's, I'd imagine you would probably say that sort of like how much does a house cost? Um, you know, like some environments uh, can be very complex. Like, like Ivan was saying, some of them you can get from a marketplace, but then they need to be modified and sort of optimized to work on the, on the space. Um, in, but in your, um, Sorry, I don't know if that was my internet cutting out. Sometimes it's. Um, is that me or you? I don't know. Is that One me of or us, you? probably me. Uh, <laughs> it might happen a few more times. People can yeah. give me the freezy <laughs> award. Um, but for, do you have a sense of like you? You talked about time and you talked about vaguely expense the investments, but you give maybe how many cents all part of those? Well, I mean, there's. 
it, it's hard. Like I really no, uh, because it all depends on what you're going to build and what you're going to do. I, I've uh, I've talked to some video game places that are sort of like, oh, I can make you a a really simple environment for for six thousand dollars. But if your project just needs a room, you know, like if if there, there's four like your room, if if that's what you need is behind it and it needs the depth because you're going to get up and walk across it, maybe the the Unreal Marketplace is the way to go, and you're going to spend six hundred bucks and you know uh, maybe five hundred to thousand bucks for for someone to clean it up and and away it goes uh it could cost as much you know as two hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you're you know it, it it is very much the wild west but the the people who are creating the environments and the stages are really trying to push this and and working i know that there's a lot of indie people that have shot stuff on the walls with just the volume stages and and the the environment building companies are like look we just need people using this stuff and getting used to it so in some cases they'll give you low budgets or freebies just to get there but i do caution that in that from a business mindset you know the last thing you want to do is do one and go yay go do another at the same price point but you can't do it. <laughs> yeah so so utilize like right now it's it's the wild west and and we can make things happen but but we we do need to have an eye to to the future and what we're going to look at right yeah well let's there's some people are asking some creative questions that i think are interesting um mariah is asking can you use it for interior shots i mean a lot of times what you see is exterior which might lead people to think that it can only be used for exterior type worlds but could it be used for interior you you can shoot this the same way as on a green screen stage you can shoot it anywhere and the difference between it and sort of a green screen stage is even in an interior you have the base lighting from your environment absolutely you can use it in interiors you could use it in an interior where you know if you're just sitting on if if you're in a living room watching tv you could literally just have the couch and shoot it in front of the wall and that's the only maybe a light or something you can shoot through but you can totally shoot in your interiors if you need to and you're going to build sets you can use it outside of windows you know if you want to be on mars and you want the depth you could use it outside of a window and build the portions uh, of your um uh, like physically build the flats and that sort of thing to shoot yeah. through windows uh, and and that kind of environment. Um, it, it it is used for everything. And I think that it as as we move ahead and we get to the future, I personally think that it will be doing everything. Like we won't need. Yeah, to go there are some there's the some great ahead. examples of of doing interior work. Um, there's some scenes in in Mandalorian where they they went to actual locations, scanned them in 3D, modified them oh. slightly, brought brought to the volume um where they're you know if you were to stand on the stage it would look very strange because all the walls are warping and stuff but if you look right through the lens they're moving in just a way that it looks like that wall is just a few feet away um even though it might be much further um andrew chu has a really interesting question about is there a, a process when you're shooting traditional traditionally to capture stuff so that you could use those environments on a volume later for reshoots like is there you know if you're mo you're moving through your traditional sets and you want to get something in case you ever need to come back here but do it virtually how would is there a way of doing uh, that or how uh, absolutely santa claus nine or whatever it was uh just just did that where they had to go back to santa's workshop which was a physical set that they had built back in i don't know 2005 whenever it was that it came out they pulled plates from the footage that they had shot, painted people out, brought it in and put it in and shot on it. And it, it it's seamless. Absolutely, you can use, it, it's it's rear screen projection and the level of um, difficulty and cost and prep time extra that, that leads to it. If it's just an image like this, it, it, it takes no time if you want there to be parallax because we're going to move the camera here and you want to see these two spikes do this as we move then you're going to have to put more time into changing this into a more three-dimensional object yeah but you could you could get close-ups um if you so, captured your environment oh. and you, and your close-ups weren't moving and you're on sort of a long lens you, you could you could get a lot of your close-ups and get totally. re recapture lines we have our first brave soul 
Matthew Manhire has raised his hand. Uh, so I'm gonna bring him onto the stage and we'll get to ask his question live. Um, so hopefully he pops up here. Matthew, take it away. Oh, hey, how's it going, everybody? Nice to meet you. Zach, how hey. are you? Nice Good to, to meet you, you, Matthew. Ivan, hi. Yep. Um, I have a quick question for you. So I've been working in the commercial world, uh, just focused on this for the last three or four years. And we've had a chance to really break some ground with in terms of working with 2D enhanced video plates and 3D uh, digital worlds. Now, on your side of things, what do you think would be more valuable um, creating shows with virtual production in mind to be shot entirely on the wall or thinking in the sense of having kind of a mixture and um, you know, thinking that some environments should be shot on the wall and then some should just be left to the real world. What do you think is gonna have more value in the next say 18 months to three years? Um, uh, that, that's, that's really interesting to say. Uh, it, it, uh... In, in the future, I can see a world where everything do, is done in stage because you're a completely controlled environment, right? You, you, don't, have, you don't have angry neighbors or cars driving down roads and, and <laughs> things like that, right? Like, uh, and as, uh, you know, AI gets into the thing and, and XR gets into it and, and the abilities start to get bigger, I think that, that that will happen. I don't know if location shooting will ever go away completely. Um, I, I can't pick up the magic eight ball with that. If you're asking in terms of of the business, um, I think for for the short term, it, it's like there's a lot of education that has to happen in what we're doing, right? Like you, we as yeah, the agree. filmmakers need to learn how to adopt it and stop being afraid of it and and demystify it. Uh, the we have to communicate with the volume studios on what we do. We have to learn our languages and how to commute and to communicate with each other in prep, shoot, post all the way through it. And <clears throat> we also have to communicate with people who may not be used to the, the production pipeline at all, gaming companies and, and learning how to get the stuff that we're gonna get, the people who make the stuff that goes on the wall. But the other big piece of the puzzle from a producer standpoint uh, is, getting the business to understand and so that we can cash flow this stuff and do it because we might it's mm -hmm. especially in my low budget range like the, the, the eyes will just go when you're like yeah i'm going to need 25 percent of my budget six months before you even are looking at hiring cast right like what no absolutely we're running into that in the commercial world too right so it's it's a uh the short term is for right now uh it it is what is best and easiest for your production and how you're going to get it greenlit. Like I said, the rising mm -hmm. tide floats all boats, right? If you go in and you're just going to do driving plates, but you can sneak the cafe shot in front of the virtual and whoever mm -hmm. your studio or network is, don't notice it and go, wow, that looks really good. Then you say, oh, I shot that virtual. That's a win, right? Um, yep. But it, it, it's it, it's really hard to say what's more valuable because I think right now we're just trying to to uh, not be afraid of doing it and not not just default going. There's no way I can afford that, and then also being able to communicate as we're developing things what we're trying to do. So it, it's easier sometimes to have a to get people to buy into a smaller space because maybe one one scene virtual is is something that you, you can get the money for versus the whole show uh, i mm -hmm. personally am pushing both right like yeah. to me i want to get back in studio as soon as i can i don't like standing in the rain and the snow uh and, and I can get back <laughs> in stage baby that's where i want to go i'm old uh, man i'm old yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. i don't Thanks. think you're alone on yeah. that one <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great to see you again. Um, yeah, good, good. Turning Thanks, alumni. Nice <laughs> Matt Manhire. Um, awesome. A few other great questions coming in. We have a lot of questions, which is great. Um, the uh, one question is, what would you say like are producers' biggest fears when you're first presenting the idea to them and they know nothing about it? And what do you sort of what do you often say, or studio, or like when you're when the when the question comes up, what are sort of people's gut reaction that you then? I I, I think I think them? yeah, totally. I, I think I think that the biggest, I mean, other than 
there's no way we can afford it or hey it shoots tomorrow let's see if we can do this virtual i mean other other than those two sort of sort of thoughts the the biggest fear is it's not going to look good right it's going to look cartoony it's going to look fake it's not going to work uh, and all i say to people on that is, is that's not really a problem that's a fear because if you're doing this on a green screen and you're doing this as a matte painting or whatever else, the problem is the problem is the problem, right? It's the same problem. So don't worry about that, right? Get into yeah. it, make it the best that you can, and it will be amazing. And I do also have to say that uh, I've noticed sort of from the, the, the studio all the way through it when I'm dealing with video game people, there's a knee jerk reaction because people like my, my background is visual effects. So I'm used to seeing things at the milestones of when you go, I'm just going to lay out the stuff. What do you think about this? And lots of times, specifically in the visual effects world, producers will see a temp and just go, that sucks and move and try to move away from it, as opposed to knowing what the process is and the pipeline is and letting it get to its final thing. So, uh, again, that's where the communication comes in and learning to trust the people, but the yeah. the problem is the problem and the art will look amazing and once you see that frustum and the thing rendered with the depth cue and everything else it looks way different than your unrendered background right yeah and a few people have asked this question which i think is a great follow-up to that which is uh what would you say are the things of virtual gym right now that that you know are an area that probably you people should be aware of uh that you shouldn't tread into well i mean i i think uh Again, from my my and I touched on this in sort of what when I when I was talking, in my indie space of looking at things, um, a lot of the really awesome stuff that gets us so excited about virtual production doesn't serve us to be trying to do, which is changing stuff on the day, unless you're at the right place and you've planned for it and done all of the things that can kind of go to it, just because of time and schedule. Um, but I think that outside in a bright sunshine at high noon right like if you if you if you uh uh man mandalorian if you look at mandalorian like a lot of the times he's still standing in shade right he's not standing under the bright sunshine and doing that so just explain why that is for a sec because people it might not be uh, obvious to people well it's 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 the the bright source of sunshine coming straight down from the top of it and when you're doing that kind of thing it's a it's hard to do to put the light in the right place and do the things and all the rest of it but b it can make you pop off your background it's like your green screen if you have too much of a backlight on it you get a rim and a halo around it and it doesn't look as good the illusion kind of gets blown right so yeah. that's one thing or at least that's how i think about it again i'm sort of indie that might not be the you know, if you talk to the ILM folks, they might tell you a better reason why they is so ask that question to them again. Um, I think also things like uh, concerning things are heavy action, right? Like if you're going to try and run handheld with someone, it's going to be a problem, right? Or or you can face lots of problems. I don't want to say it's insurmountable. It might be better to put it on a steady cam and have it smooth, shoot handheld thing, visual effects what the camera should look like and then apply that in post but yeah. uh heavy duty action and running is is a is a thing right um two people asked the same question uh about basically special effects like weather elements snow rain mist fire are those elements things that can be used with with virtual production um the 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 short answer is yes the long answer is i don't want to speak for the studios um you know i i i still am wrapping my head around electrostatic magnetism um uh, what what that will do and and things like that um so certainly if you look around on youtube at the behind the scenes stuff there's places with lots of rain there's, you know, air cannons and things like that in the foreground, and certainly there's those things going. But this is that communicate to the specific place um, yeah. that you're going to be working with, and, the, and they'll help tell the you. Shoot, the shoot we did last year, um, we we had a lot of success with those elements in in sort of keeping them contained. So, for example, we did have um, atmosphere. Atmosphere is really great to use because it cap it. It gets illuminated by the light from the wall. 
We also used um, torches. So it wasn't just like flames everywhere, but it was torches. And those, those worked incredibly well because not only were they real torches that were shedding light on the actors, but there were virtual torches continued into the virtual space. So it, it kind of created a vanishing point of torches that really helped sell the illusion. One of our, one of our directors also um, created a puddle. So you could look down into the puddle and see a character walk through the puddle and the puddle's reflecting the environment just like a puddle would. And then you come up off that and, and look at the people. And, and so those are ways that I think those are all contained, but they really, by bringing those real elements into the world, it really brought it, it really made it feel real. Um, so I think those are really great. Yeah, ab Great. absolutely. I mean, that that's the what goes in front of the wall is as if not more important of what you're doing a wall, because just like you said, with those torches, and I, I sort of mentioned that if there's set pieces in the wall that help give you that real world sort of thing, like uh, amazing. And that's that virtual art department and, and, and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get into the whole virtual art department um, in a few months. Uh, the things I learned on that that was really cool is they, uh, which Matt Milton, who was our production designer, and he's in the panel coming up, um, talked about designing because he designs um, a lot of the sets for for Star Trek, and they design them both to to have repeating elements that that so benches or torches or we had lampposts, all that kind of repeat physically, and then repeat digitally, so yeah. that it becomes difficult and sometimes even standing on the stage it becomes difficult to to know which one is which because there's three real lamp posts and then 20 ones but exactly where it transitions can sometimes be be tricky the other thing that they do that's really interesting is they build the sets often to be symmetrical or to look down upon them from above so um three three lamp posts and three benches you can flip one a physically and it's and it's symmetrical it's the same thing so what that allows you to do is rotate the environment 180 degrees essentially turning around but not having to move any of the physical elements that are on the stage because they work in both directions oh, yeah for the, the reverse yeah, that's amazing i love so that stuff just designing designing the sets to be flipped uh so that um that turnaround can literally take just a few minutes um, speaking of just a few minutes, we've got just a few more minutes of uh, questions here. Um, let me just uh, find one that's uh, one quick question is uh, Christian Dubois is asking about um, multi camera. Um, is it possible to shoot more in camera? I know there's different vendors have different solutions to that, but what, what would be your, your answer to that? Uh, sh short, short answer is yes. Uh, talk to your vendor. Uh, technically speaking, with all the digital stuff, you could, uh, you know, in theory, shoot the virtual wall, and as the shutters in off shutter, sort of, in, in some kind of trying to keep it lay terms, if your camera shutter is flipping around, you could be capturing it with green screen on background at the same time and have both. So yes, you can display things at different times. Two cameras, in the simplest terms, you just don't have them overlap, right? So you don't have the Field the view overlap and and that that's a simple way to do it. There are other ways, but talk with talk again, communicate with the um, yeah, with the vendor word, and they'll, they'll tell you. A word you you you'll hear hear a lot in virtual production is frustrum. Basically, just means what the, what the camera can see. If you imagine the frustrum is a is a shape, but it's basically like a triangular shape that's a square, um, and whatever that square is where the camera can see. And if you're shooting more than one camera, you, you try and make sure that the two cameras aren't looking at the same place on the wall because the wall is showing a perspective that only works for one camera. What I've, I've been saying is there are some technologies where the cameras, the screens can refresh at a rate fast enough where they both can be looking at the same part of the wall. In one twenty-fourth of a second, it shows this camera something, and for one twenty-fourth of a second, it shows this camera something. Or an example, he was saying it shows green to this camera and then environment to this camera, so that you're actually capturing sort of two things at the same time uh, with with the camera's frame rates uh, synced to the wall. That's still pretty cutting edge stuff. Um, yeah. So the the main the main way of doing it is just not having them point at the same thing. Exactly. Um, and that's that's probably the easier way uh, of doing it. 
or single camera shoot and save the money. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, a few more interesting questions. Um, you know, new user and new deliveries are sort of having HDR as a as a delivery factor. Does is recording in HDR work on a virtual wall? Is, is having a, that bigger dynamic range? Is there anything that would prevent you from doing that? Uh, uh, re really, it uh, uh, would be the pixel pitch of the wall. I think there are 8K walls and and things like that. Uh, again, all of those questions should be asked in in advance. Yeah. Of... Well, let me explain what pixel pitch is because people may not understand know what that is. If I can, I'm going to leave that to to the <laughs> professionals. Uh, like I get it. Our next panel will be it, very good. Every time I try to talk about it, I just sound like a like a like a babbling fool. So I guess I'm just gonna leave that. Like yeah. sure. Our uh, our next panel, Pixel Mundo. I'm sure they'll cover Pixel Pitch. Um. So if I don't, if they don't, and I forget to ask that question, someone remind me to to explain what what Pixel Pitch is. Um. Let's see here. Uh. So I'd be looking at the questions. There's no downtime here, but we have a few more we can we can cram in here. Um, we have so many questions though. I'm not used to have us having so many. If anyone wants to raise their hand, this is your last chance. Um, don't, be, don't be shy. Why not? Someone's asking like, how much has it changed in the last five years? I'm also curious your thoughts on where do you think it's going to change in the next five years? Oh. Um... Well, I, I think it'll change in the next five years where you're not going to need a massive wall. Uh, you, you, think of it in terms of like when you're doing a visual effects and, and you're shooting something and you've got the matte line and everything up there is going to be a visual effects shot and you don't want to put on green screen or you know that kind of thing. So you just make sure everyone is contained under the edge of that. Uh, or you put a green screen on the top of it. So if anybody bleeds over the top of it, then you can, you can key it and put it into it. I think that with xr or, or the augmented reality stuff that you're seeing on, on mobile phones and stuff like that uh, because above the matte line the interactive light doesn't matter i don't want to say it doesn't matter but it's not really important to light your character and to immerse them they're immersed by what's definitively around them that that will just become a thing so we won't have to try and go into a 60 foot tall you know that type of space uh, I think the ceilings might come around with it. Uh, I think that uh, 360 uh, video and stuff like that might start coming into creating and capturing backgrounds. Uh, I think that um, camera tracking, like like uh, uh, photogrammetry, will come into building our backgrounds. They will become way faster, way easier to use. And I think that AI is going to take anything that I'm saying right now and throw it out the window and invent all kinds of crazy new things over Lord. Yeah, don't don't piss off the AI. We want, we all want to. <laughs> They're listening right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they actually are. They're doing live transcriptions in French. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so they are actually listening. Um, a few last quick questions that I think are interesting. Um, you may not have the answer to this, but it's something I, I found interesting. Is what are the kind of copyright elements to the assets? Um, do you, have, do you have any thoughts around that? Assets uh, meaning- I do. Stuff that goes the virtual. Yes, what, what's being created and, and in the background. I, I would say that for the short term, it would be the same as visual effects um, uh, in that there is intellectual property that comes around to things where um, if I create something of my own in my mind and give it to you, it's still mine, right? Like I'm the writer of a script. It's still, you know, I got a credit and I get a piece of the pie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think if you think about it in terms of visual effects, that's one way to go do it. But most places are work for hire, right? Their crews and people are hired in that direction so that the studio has the rights to give things and people have figured this stuff out. But uh, if you are just going to give uh, a studio the script and say make me Atlantis um, and they create it completely without any of your input and give it to you there is an argument to be made that the intellectual property is that of you know um, but I, I don't I don't see it as as an issue uh, I think that specifically <clears throat> you know um, most locations are going to be script dependent and while yes you can use reuse 
offices and things like that. I don't think anyone's going to try and say I created that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not, there are, in, you know, there are interesting news I've heard of where, because often you're also scanning something that's real into 3D to use it as a 3D asset. So who owns that? The person who owns the physical object that it's been, or the person who created the scan <laughs> is, is an well, interesting, uh, interesting that, debate. That goes into like the truth of the matter is, is it's like the Hollywood sign or the Eiffel Tower, um, I think at night. Right. Yeah. The, Where the, the people that designed the lights own it. Mm -hmm. The people that there, there's a group that owns the Hollywood sign. If you want to show it in your film, you have to license that from them. And if you try to put that into your show without their permission, <clears throat> you could be putting yourself at risk, even if you made it yourself, even if you change the font text size and the rest of it, yeah. uh, you know, Follow, follow the simple rules of things. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the people who design buildings can own the rights to the building just because they designed the, the architect or the architect, right? So think about that stuff. Well, thank you so much, Ivan. Sorry for the people who asked questions. We couldn't get to them. I'm loving how many we have. Sorry to, to Mars and Stan Shosh, uh, who raised their hand, but a little bit too late for me to get to them. We'd have to go on to our next uh, panel, but thank you so much, Ivan, for kicking things off. Uh, great to see you and, and, and great job. Um, the next panel we'll be doing in just a minute is our stage six presentation by Pixamondo William F. White, where Lisa Rose Snow will be moderating a, a conversation, giving us a tour of what an actual LED volume looks like, all the different elements that go into making it work. Um, but before we get to that, we're quickly going to play another interstitial, two sizzle reels uh, from Pixo that are going to give us kind of an overview of these stages and a little recap on the, the areas that they have. So we'll hit those videos and thank you, Ivan. Amazing, thanks everybody, enjoy. So we're very excited to go into our next panel. Uh, first, I'm going to be introducing our moderator. Uh, hopefully, we have uh, uh, Lisa Rose here. Um, let's bring her in. Yes, we have Lisa Rose. Great. Lisa Rose is a great friend of mine. She's an award-winning director, writer, director. She's won many awards, including the Women in View, where she was named one of the top three emerging female directors, the Telephone New Choice Award, the WIFT Award for Women Making Waves, 
She has lots of recent directing credits, uh, including Lockdown on YouTube, Emmy, the Emmy-winning series Odd Squad on PBS and Dino Dana, and a pilot for her uh, called Rogue Bridal. Uh, and she's worked in many writing rooms. She's an incredible talent. She's also the rep of all the directors in Ontario at the DGC, uh, an all-around great human being. Lisa Rose, great to see you. Thanks for coming out. Hi, thanks. That was a very lovely intro. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, and so you're going to be kicking us off, giving us a sense of uh, some of the stage stages and what they're like. Um, so over to you. Great. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here and chat. So for this panel, we'll be talking sort of the technical side of, of the wall. And I'm coming in as the sort of... Um, uh, beginner's mindset person. So if anyone is saying any, um, you know, phrases or things that I don't understand, I'm going to jump in and um, share them. So what I'll do first is I'll give a the bios of our, our, our wonderful panelists, and then we'll show, I believe we have one more sizzle reel to show from them, and then, uh, then we'll get right to our tour. Um, so our first panelist will be Chris Cox, and Chris is a virtual production executive producer leading a variety of virtual production initiatives across the industry, including education, adoption, film, and television production across the globe. Chris is a virtual production executive producer at Pixomundo, where he oversees the deployment, operations, and integration of virtual production projects. Previously, he was the head of CG production at SpinFX and has worked as a stereo producer and documentary producer. Under his leadership, his teams have earned VES and Emmy nominations for their work on many fan favorites, award-winning projects. And he began his career in documentary filmmaking, producing the 2013 film entitled Our Man in Tehran, for which his team won multiple Canadian Screen Awards after its successful premiere at TIFF. Hey, Chris, nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Hi, and Chris is also joining us. He is actually in the uh, stage six. Uh, LED wall behind him turned off, but he's joining us from the stage itself that we'll be talking about today. And we also have Phil Jones joining us, who's a VP and VFX supervisor at Pixamundo. And Phil Jones is both a client side and vendor side VFX supervisor, thanks to his longstanding relationships with filmmakers and production companies who trust him as their go-to supervisor. His client side supervision includes the TV series, Wyona Earp, the feature, I Feel Pretty, the Anne Hathaway End of the World feature Colossal and the war film Hyena Road, which earned Phil a best VFX win at the Canadian Screen Awards. For years, Phil has excelled in full CG VFX supervi supervision. These include the World War I feature Midway, the Navy Steel Center Hunter Killer Hyena Road, and Texas Rising, among many others. On Midway, which Pixo co-produced, Phil supervised the creation of CG vehicles such as aircraft carriers, as well as the film Hero Dive Bomber and full CG sequences throughout the movie. Now, Phil operates as an expert virtual production and VFX supervisor. He has overseen um, content and successful virtual production shoots on the last two seasons of Star Trek Discovery, the premiere season of Beacon 23, countless virtual production like commercials, and a variety of unreleased productions. Ooh, I like that. You're leaving us, <laughs> leaving us a little curious there, Phil. Well, thank you both for, for being here. Wonderful to have you. Um, also love so many of the shows you've worked on, so kudos for um, bringing your art to the masses. And I believe we have one more sizzle to show before we start. Is that true? I think before that was that, the one that? you started at the lead up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, good. Yeah. We're already ahead of my schedule, so I love <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah, so like I said, Chris is joining us today from stage six. Um, and anyone that will be applying for the virtual production to shoot here in Toronto, so for when we do the, the next uh, Toronto director's call, Chris is actually in the studio where you will be shooting. So a little sneak, sneak uh, preview. Um, but I'm going to you guys take it away and start us off with the tech talk. And I'll jump in with any questions. Um, and otherwise, uh, love to hear what you have to say. Great. Thanks for uh, the DGC and everybody putting this together. And and um, really happy that we're doing this again this year. It was a ton of fun last year. And as Lisa was mentioning, um, the Toronto chapter shot um, the short films um, here at this stage and figured we'd want to talk a little bit through this uh, this location as the, we'll be doing it again this year. 
Um, Pixamundo has, uh, in partner, partnership with William F. White, we've got three uh, LED volumes. Um, we've since packaged up our, our Vancouver volume, turning it into more of a deployment model. But this is one of our stages down here at Studio City, stage six. Um, it's been up for, oh boy, now, I guess two, two years now. Almost two um, years, yeah. or just almost two years, yeah. Um, and this space is at Studio City. It's a 16,000 square feet stage um, with about a 4,000 square foot footprint of the virtual production LED wall. Um, the LED wall, and as, as we're going to talk a little bit a bit uh, in a beginner's language about some of virtual production components, you'll see multiple, lots of different shapes of volumes and evolving shapes of LED volumes as the industry uh, uh, sort of adjusts to the production requirements. This one is a semicircle, uh, 180 degrees. You'll see many others that are horseshoe shapes. There's the J shapes. There's the wild wall shapes. There's a variety of different ones. This one's a semicircle at 180 degrees. It's a total of 915 panels. Um, our LED panels are with row. They're BPV2s. Um, I think they're about, I think, Phil, are they 2.8 uh, millimeter pixel pitch? 2.5. 2.5. Mm -hmm. And on the last last panel, I believe there was a, a question about pixel pitch. So I'll do my best here to sort of tangent onto that quickly. Pixel pitch, um, for those that aren't really uh, aware, essentially it can be simplified down to like the density of the pixels in the panel. Um, smaller pixel pitch indicates kind of like a higher density, which gives you a little bit more resolution in, in, in that sort of terminology. But this, uh, that if you're de determining what pixel pitch you want on your project, it all kind of depends on where you want to shoot in the volume, how close to the panels you want to get. So essentially talking about, you know, optimal viewing distance is going to dictate the pixel pitch you're looking for. A smaller pixel pitch means you can shoot closer to the wall. So mm -hmm. these two are 2.5s. Um, there's a variety of on the market and it also can determine, you know, your budget. If you really do need to get close to the wall, there's going to be a case where uh, the pixel pitch being smaller might be a little bit more costly depending on what, mm -hmm. what vendor you have. There's a sweet spot. We all have been trying to find that sweet spot, which effectively is every project's different. So we have to be malleable. So pixel pitch in a, in a, in a simple brief is essentially the pixel density and then smaller pixel pitch means you can shoot closer to the wall. Um, we are 2.5 or 2. Point, yeah, 2.5, sorry. 2.84, I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Off by so we're 2.8. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it really, it's a, a bit of a in the middle where we think we can accomplish a lot of different creative execution. So um, anyways, I'll veer from that. And if any questions come up later, we can answer them again. Um, what's interesting about this, the stage behind, uh, behind me, which is where Phil and I spend most of our days, um, is that the ceiling is on motors. What that means is that the ceiling is low, uh, malleable. Uh, it's hung by each section is hung by chain motors that allows, uh, productions to lower, um, the ceiling, raise the ceiling, pitch it, pivot it, essentially kind of sculpting your light, sculpting your reflections. Um, one of the, what, what, uh, the purpose of virtual production really in, in an execution is making sure that the light up from the wall is actually meeting the practical elements and producing a real life lighting scenario that then blends into the, uh, virtual environment. What we can do with the ceiling like this is that you can lower the ceiling, uh, towards, uh, whatever you have on site. We chose a, a machine, uh, sorry, a, a ceiling like this for this stage on, on motors, chain motors because it does serve kind of commercials and small productions. This is a stage that can service, you know, episodic feature and smaller productions like commercials, smaller budget productions to make sure it's a little bit more accessible. Uh, this allows some lighting, uh, if, if we can't afford a certain lighting package, this can offer some soft light um, to productions. Mm -hmm. Really nice for highly reflective surfaces like cars and, and water. Um, and then at the same time, if, um, if you don't want them, raise them up and, and get them out of the way and then hang, hang the rest of your lights. Um, so we, we call it an articulated ceiling. It is a different pix, uh, panel than the wall. That's because the ceiling isn't designed to be on camera. Um, it's designed to be essentially a lighting source. So it has a higher nit ratio. Um, most walls, as you'll see behind me, there's, let's see if I can do this there. there there's a seam. Um, and uh, that's essentially, we try to, uh, uh, inform productions not to shoot the seam. Uh, essentially, wide shots will catch the seam. That means you have to go to post and, and clean it up. Our goal is to be successful in camera, um, mm -hmm. so that's why we do have the ceiling being not not uh, the same resolution or the same panel as the wall because it's designed specifically to light um, your set. Um, so, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, please, when oh. as I go here. But we have uh, yep. we run a wall LED wall with the A6000 GPUs. Uh, we run uh, our tracking system here at this location is 
OptiTrack. Um, we have roughly 45 cameras uh, with a, a mocap array that is roughly allows for two cameras. We can go up to three, but we do run very often a two camera system. Mm -hmm. um, Phil, could you elaborate on the value of a two camera system and the value of uh, a, a motion capture array and what exactly that motion capture array supports during the production? Absolutely. Um, yeah, for motion capture, what we're doing is we're we're capturing the actual position of the camera or cameras within the uh, within the volume itself. And then what we do, we take that 3D position in the real world, and then we bring that into the computer so that within the computer, our virtual camera is in the exact same position within the volume that our real camera is. And that allows us to get the absolutely correct perspective from the from the real camera and put that on the wall. So wherever your camera is positioned it within the environment, it has the actual proper perspective. And that is the only place, if you're standing in the wall and you're not where the camera is, the wall perspective is going to look completely wrong. So the only place the perspective looks correct is from the camera itself. And we have, we have the ability to do, uh, and this is a hardware um, a hardware limitation, I guess you would say. Depending on how many GPUs you have in your systems, you can render more one or two, maybe three, if you have more GPUs, uh, frustums. And what a frustum is is it's the actual field of view the camera is seeing, and then we we get that we project it on the wall. And what that allows us to do is render a higher resolution image within the field of view of the camera on the wall itself. So this is more about our GP, the GPU power. So if you have, in our case, we we are set up for two frustums. So we will have a front, one camera's field of view on the wall and then another camera's field of view on a different part of the wall. Uh, the one issue is is you can't you can't do a cross with the two frustums, so they can't your cameras can't do this at the moment. Um, we there are ways to make it work where two where a frustum crosses. Um, what we call it is we call it Ghostbusters when uh, when the two streams cross. There's a there's going to be a problem, and one of those streams uh, one of those frustums has to take priority. So we'll go above the other basically so as you as one camera pans into the other the one frustum will take priority mm -hmm. um, there are ways to basically flicker the screen so that one frustum is visible in one frame and another is in another we've tried it and it makes everybody sick yeah. so <laughs> so yeah. it's something that we everybody everybody learns to work with uh, so that one you have to shoot you can't shoot one camera over the other, you sort of have to keep them side by each, um, or or across, depending on the uh, the wall itself. And what what this allows us you to do is have two cameras shooting at the same time. We actually have shot three cameras, um, but we have not tracked that third camera. Sorry, we could track the third camera. But we we don't have enough uh, we don't have enough GPU to get a third frustum up there, and so. But that honestly worked for a lot of uh, long lens shots where the background is really out of focus and the perspective really doesn't matter at that point. Uh, so we were able to get three cameras shooting in the volume at the same time. Two of them actually had their proper perspectives uh, within their within the backgrounds. But the third was just shooting off and getting tighter shots. And it was more about you know movement and things in the background. So you can get away with it. Um, and there are, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes, sometimes it might not work, but it just depends on if you want to try to shoot a third camera without tracking, which is a possibility. And can I just, uh, interject to just to ask what's the GPU? Oh, sorry. Uh, GPU is the graphics processing unit. It's, uh, the, uh, basically the video card and cool. that those are the, the GPUs in this case, we're using NVIDIA A6000s, which are, basically the fastest thing you can get on the market at the moment um and we're cramming two of them into our systems so we're we're able to render two full frustums at at high at 4k resolution basically usually a little bit higher 
and also our what we call the outer projection. So the outer projection is anything, any of the environment you're seeing on the wall that is not within the camera's field of view, we call the outer projection. And we can have we can either shoot with that only and not have a frustum, and that has the proper parallax for a single camera. So you have to have the frustum to get more than one camera. So you can actually get the proper parallax from two different perspectives. Great. Cool. So thanks, Phil. So um, considering this is one of the locations that we'll be shooting at, I think it'll be important for some of the folks to see what has been shot on this size of a stage. I'm going to share my screen briefly to show essentially a blueprint of the space. Um, a lot of the kind of buzziness of the virtual production has caused a little bit of misinformation. What I think is important is that any size of stage can also be can benefit any size of production. It just comes down to a little bit of the way that the art is generated for it and, and what, what works for it. Also, um, the build it and they will come scenario for a business strategy like Fix Mundo had entered, which is like building a stage and say, everyone come, doesn't necessarily work for every production. So that, yes, we have a permanent installation here. Um, but it's malleable. We can add panels to add rows to the ceiling, or sorry, to the to the top of the wall, uh, extend the wall out. Um, we can add wild walls, which are essentially walls that can, you know, plug the volume so that there's the has a bit more of a 360 action. Um, we are moving more towards that deployment model. That way, productions do have an opportunity to um, have a wall built bespoke to their needs as the as the costs of of um, virtual production come down a bit. That means we get more opportunity to build according to a production's needs. I'm just going to share a little bit of a blueprint here. Um, should I share the right screen and not my grocery order? There we go. <laughs> the best groceries for the virtual production wall. Right. <laughs> OK. Uh, is that OK there, Lisa? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Great. So this is the um, blueprint of Studio City, uh, stage six with our wall. And what's important here for everyone to see is that it is a 16,000 square foot space. And you can see the wall here, which is taking up about uh, 4,000 square feet because we do have our servers back here um, driving it. And then our space here, 180 degree wall. Um, throughout um, the, the conversation now, we can talk about some of the, the words that are associated, some of the new rhetoric and definitions of words that you might come across in virtual production. One of them is brain bar, volume mm. control, um, mission control. I like uh, I like mission, mission control, but whatever we want to call it, this is essentially this section here. Every virtual production stage and LED volume is going to have uh, a brain bar. And that's where your engine operators, your mocap operators, um uh, are, are sitting essentially driving the wall it's real-time rendering it is a computer program it's a computer engine this is something that needs to run uh, throughout your production be maintained throughout the production in order to make sure your production remains efficient the last thing we want to do is shut down a production uh, because we had a crash or because you know something's not working that team is there dedicated to your production on site taking instructions for either technical specs and requirements or creative requirements um at the base uh, virtual production offers control and creative control uh, and more dynamic malleability on your production shoot um, than traditional production. This team at the brain bar here, every every studio has their own, um, is essentially there to um, uh, on the prior to production essentially make sure the art is matching up the physical production, the practical requirements are being matched, and then on the day. If your directors, your DPs, or your art department, anybody does need changes, um, we're able to operate them. We have built-in controls in the Unreal Engine or even in playback solutions, like we operate um, some playback in, in Touch Designer, which is still a very nice um, uh, procedural um, program to run driving footage and that sort of thing. We still have color control, lighting control, you know, lifting blacks, lowering, uh, lowering camera, anything like that that offers a control to your director. One of the reasons I wanted to show this, this space was because it's not always comfortable for a production to come in and say, well, we can't go where you are type thing. We're taking up space. A production comes in, they want to rent the, the stage, uh, uh, their sound stage, and, and we're saying to them, well, you can't use all of it. Um, it's mm -hmm. good for everyone to, for their line producers to recognize that there are going to be spaces that are just off limits, effectively making sure the wall is protected and the operators are protected um, and have their space to work. It's serving the production. Um, so in, in, a, in a line producer's budget, or a location manager, you might say, well, where can I put DIT? Where can I put my, my traditional departments? And I'd like to offer them at least a look at the space to understand what, what sections we do need to hold on to. So from that, um, if I can 
stop sharing and queue up the, there was a video, at least I was wrong, um, mm -hmm. we'll queue up um, a bit of a, a, a sizzle reel about this space exactly where, where the productions can come in and see the type of work that has actually shot uh, successfully on the stage. Great. I believe Jason has it. Yeah, great. You're Julian, thank you. Great. Uh, so great. Uh, you know, there's just so much opportunity, especially when you think of some of those locations, like the, the ski lift one was particularly was like, oh, yeah, that's so smart. And the soccer one, like, how are you going to fill a soccer stadium, you know? Yeah, I, I think it's a great point that you bring up. And, and we had really awesome partners in that alter ego and, and um, you know, one of the really great directors in the city, Matthew Manhire, um, was reminding me that, you know, bigger is not always better. Um, mm -hmm. in a virtual production space. But what is important is how you use the content. Um, we did um, we did um, uh, the soccer stadium with with, with them and, and, and thought, well, how the heck do you do this? And the right perspective really works. And mm. in the previous conversation, previous session, um, um, everyone was mentioning atmospherics. Atmospherics can really help with depth as long as you don't go too far and flatten the wall. But, um, you know, I think we had roughly you know, 20,000, 30,000 CG agents on the crowd. Um, wow. um, they, that Matthew and, and, and Alter Ego, the team shot high high frame rate on that project as well. Um, high frame rate is always a, a, a hot topic and they had some successful, um, successful high frame rate shots in that. And then the ski lift, you know, a really interesting solution, which was actually kind of more of a two and a half D approach, whereas traditional map painting structure in a 3D environment, um, mm. Maybe Phil, I could throw to you and you could talk a little bit about the high frame rate restrictions mm -hmm. and how the industry is really looking for different high frame rate solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, uh, I'm going to share my screen and just uh, show off a, another document uh, just with some items and some key frame key keywords. But Phil, if you can talk through a little bit of the high frame rate items. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. sure. Uh, a lot of the um, what what we uh, are lim what our limitations are. Let's put it that way. Uh, are based on our the GPUs that we have in our system, so the video cards, and because everything is being rendered by those those GPUs in real time, and we are we are limited by the power that they have, and as as they get better and better and better, and that happens so fast, um, we are able to uh, to render more and more and more, um, and what. We need what has to happen is we we also need to be able to render everything on the wall in 3D at the same frame rate that the camera is shooting. Mm -hmm. So generally, we are rendering at uh, 24 or 2398, how it, however you want to, uh, however you want to shoot there. Uh, that is a um, that is a, well, it's obviously very common, but it's a so far for us, you know, that's a very stable uh, frame rate to work at. Because uh, we can tune our environments to work with the frame rate that we're going to shoot. Um, everybody, we all want to shoot the super high frame rate uh, 
things as well. And depending on the environment, um, we could run it at a faster speed to match the uh, the render of the, or pardon me, the uh, frame rate of the camera. Uh, this is that's where there's a, a trade off between the visual, like what you want to see and what you want to show, how much is in your scene, and how fast you need to shoot. Um, because the we do get limited by hardware uh, most mm. of the time, and not not on the camera, but on uh, uh, hardware and rendering speeds. We have been able to we depending on the environment, we can pare down some things so we have less for the GPU to to worry about, and then we can uh, play at a higher frame rate. And we have to that's one thing we need to know beforehand because when we're building the environments, we're 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 constantly pushing it like pushing the system right to its edge and just so we can get the the best the best looking image on the wall and so in if there are certain scenes that need to be shot at a higher frame rate we will either sometimes i say remove but remove elements that we don't we won't see uh, so we're giving ourselves more uh, opportunity to to get a higher frame rate out of the system but still keeping the the visual uh, quality up yeah that makes sense to me that makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, there's some kind of keywords that you might yeah. the the group should should um, start familiarizing themselves with, uh, and of, of course the other panels are going to really dive further in depth on a lot of them. But it's some of the base items that um, you'll hear as entering virtual production, entering the realm, um, is something like in camera VFX. You'll hear IC VFX, um, essentially. That is that that just is referring to you know the methodology for shooting uh, on site on a stage where you're looking for an in-camera final. Um, you know at the base of VAD, which is the virtual art department, a lot of our, our resources are VFX artists converted to engine artists and, and turning that mm -hmm. into a virtual art department. Um, our relationship with the art department is very important um, in order to have a successful in-camera VFX shoot. Um, each year and each each time we get um, each, each season that returns, especially in something like Star Trek and, and, and collaborating with people like Matt Middleton and, and, and others who, who really started committing to how to make this successful, increases the likelihood of a successful in-camera VFX shot. What, you, what we mean by that is that you don't have to go to post your general, your standard post VFX, um, that a successful shot is captured in camera, it's in the can, and then it goes to um, just, you know, you know, DI theoretically. One of the reasons that um, um, virtual production can be budget conscious and, 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 and uh, improve a budget is um, that if you consider it one to one costs, um, you have a hundred thousand for posts versus hundred thousand for virtual production, that is going to allow the money that you have set aside for your post and your VFX to go farther, less green screen cleanup, less rotoing flyaway hairs on green screen. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, more focus on the cool stuff that you get to do massive, you know, environments with explosions or, or CG creatures. Now, eventually, um, virtual production is going to allow for more things to be on screen, like creatures uh, and characters. But for now, if it's a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison, there's a value add to where the money's going. Um, so our goal as a, as a vendor is to have as many, much successful in-camera VFX as possible. Now, those um, um, so, some of those people in the virtual art department, would they be sitting at the brain bar or, or do they sort of do their work um, before you actually get on the floor? Um, it, it's a little it's a little of both. But Phil, do you want to field that one? Uh, sure. Uh, we yeah, we do have a little bit of both uh, those people. There's another question in the chat as well about the uh, the brain bar people. Mm -hmm. um, generally, we have our uh, our main unreal lead operator uh so unreal is the actual uh engine that's uh that's that we're using to generate the imagery on the wall and this that uh, operator is, is in charge of making sure that everything is technically working so all of the multiple computers that we're using to display the images on the wall are all working together and that the wall is is at frame rate and that we're not lose dropping any frames here and there uh just making sure everything is running optimally and also working uh with um with lighting board operators because we uh we also work uh, give we we are able to give some control to some elements in the uh in the environment to the lighting board operator uh one of the biggest ones is probably uh, light cards where we have a a fixture basically that we we give to the uh, lighting board op, and then they have control over 
cards that they can use on the wall or on the ceiling that can help uh, help with some extra lighting, uh, fill lighting usually. The other people we have, we usually have at our stages, we have a minimum of uh, two computers, which we call operator computers, usually three. Um, and those we man with um, with our artists who are usually the artists who have worked on the environment. And so they are very, uh, very familiar with the environment. They know where everything lives. They know what can be changed. They know what we can adjust. They know uh, everything that can be moved and so on and so forth. And then those artists are working at the same time uh, with the lead operator. And we're then working with the DP and the director and they're saying, they're putting the camera up, looking at their practical versus the wall. And they're adjusting their practical lighting. And then we are then uh, helping them by adjusting the background. Uh, so in the wall, so we're matching the color of the wall and the, the intensity and the contrast and everything to what is being lit practically. So, and that's, it's not something that you just put it up on the wall and it works with your practical. There's a lot of, con there's a lot of working with, uh, with the DP and with the, the lighters and the, and the gaffers and so on. And then we work to, match what they're doing practically in the in the physical or pardon me in the virtual environment so there's a and that's changing on a shot by shot basis uh because every it's just like on a normal production when you move your camera your lighting is going to change and you got to change your lighting so we have to do the same thing uh so it's there's that's basically the easiest way to equate that so we yeah, have so we have as many usually two artists working on that so and I'll be talking with the DP, for example, and we'll say, uh, he asked me to, he or she asked me to do something in the wall. We need to do this. We need to get brighter, darker, whatever. And then I can usually we'll split up the, uh, the tasks between the people. And so one person can be working on one thing, another can work on another. And then our, mm -hmm. our lead operator could even be working on something else. So it's all about the time and the speed. That's really what that's all about. Great. Thank you. And Phil, I think one of the, the another key component to the operating team uh, and their relationship with um, the entire production through virtual art department, it starts from day one um, yes. on a project. Um, we assume that virtual, uh, as long as there's a production designer that's assigned to a production, our team theoretically, our, our ask is that we're all immediately onboarded, left mm -hmm. hand to right hand. Our team at the Brain Bar, just like any 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 studio and any vendor would offer a Brain Bar team, is essentially the left hand to the right hand of your production team. Um, so what we want to make sure is comfortable for everybody is that those that don't have experience on it shouldn't worry. It's it's, it's the sort of thing where we want people that are inexperienced to come in and get to know it. And our job is to be that safety net and support as long mm -hmm. as we're participating as early as possible because the art department, virtual art department their job is to inform and integrate into the practical traditional art department um, and make sure that we're make, we're, our, our virtual set is matching the quality and, and allotting for that, uh, that seamless integration. Um, mm -hmm. I'm on a slide right now talking about DMX and, on, uh, and Unreal. So I think one of the really important components to integrating the Brain Bar team with the production team is our ability to offer um, lighting control through DMX and board ops. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on, on how the board op and how our operation fits into a traditional production via DMX control? Yep, absolutely. Um, what we've done, uh, I mentioned briefly, uh, light cards. Uh, we call them light cards. Uh, they go by different terms depending on the volume, most likely. Uh, but we're, we have created a basically a quote unquote light fixture that uh, we give to the uh, the board operator and that gives them control over and working with them we've developed this uh, this fixture as well so that they have the ability to if in its simplest form is putting up like a square of uh, a square of a color on the wall and hmm. they can move that wherever they need to be on the wall or in the ceiling which allows allows them to use the the dp to use the wall to help with some other lighting uh, for example, if if you can't get a, a light, for sometimes we they want a light that comes through the wall, uh, and that would take a, a bit of time for us to go and move, remove a panel and put a light in if we're on a shoot day. So this allows allows us to get a allows them to put up a light card where they want it, and it can get more fill light from the uh, 
from the wall itself. And that that's one that's one key thing is the wall is going to give you give you a lot of fill light and you're not going to get direct light from the wall or the ceiling. Uh, so any any direct light still needs to be practical. Um, but as well with DMX, we've also depending on the environment, um, we build in other controls that the lighting board operator uh, can then cue live uh, during the shoot. Uh, so this needs to be talked about early on in the build process as well, because um, a lot of the times what looks like a light on the wall is not really a light anymore. Um, it's it's something that we've had to, it, there's a term called baking, uh, which uh, what baking is, is it uh, in its simplest form is taking all the lights that we've added in, in CG, but then baking down and pre-rendering all of the light bounces that those lights would do around the scene because that's very uh, processor intensive and it would kill our uh, frame rate so we wouldn't be able to mm -hmm. play back in real time so we have to bake some of that down so that it's it doesn't change but then we have other other techniques and tools that we use to keep it alive so it doesn't become just a still frame or a still image um, other things we've done with DMX is we've actually had the, there's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of practical lights that were flashing on the set and the DP said, oh, I would, it would be great if we could get the light in the, in the environment to react to the, uh, to what's happening on the set. And so we worked with the, uh, with the board operator and, and got control of, gave him control of certain parts in the scene that would allow it to allow the light, practical lights and the, the virtual lights to work together. And uh, so there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of control and that actually is, it, it just speeds up the production day uh, when you have some, some DMX control because some like for, for us to, uh, to uh, pull our artists off of the, um, um, sorry, my phone was ringing. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, uh if we were to pull our artists off uh adjusting the environment to work on a light for example that's going to slow things down so we like to like to give control to the give control with dx to certain things we can we can actually uh speed up the production day cool phil thanks and, and there was a, a a component in the chat talking about you know how unreal engine <clears throat> and its uh evolution is supporting the lighting and integration we are operating on 5.1 uh, at Pixel, and I believe you know the majority of the industry is operating at 5.1. Effect effectively, Epic Games and Unreal Engine is rolling out um, constantly to improve um, operations. Like I said earlier, it is a computer program that we have to improve uh, efficiency and, and uh, allow, allow for more creative control. And one thing that came up was, you know, does Lumen support integration? And um, each stage um, in each vendor has a um a component to their infrastructure uh, that integrates the latest uh, and greatest of unreal engine um but often that's kind of relegated by the power of each of each studio um mm. and what type of processing power there is at the studio yes you can run certain things on your laptop and at home but is it going to work and function at a, at a studio that has um you know um rendering and seamless integration uh at real time in front of you on a set and not sh shutting us down for five minutes which is time and money, time is money, right? Um, so Phil, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the upgrades that we're finding are useful in, in starting to roll into uh, the virtual art department and how that's supporting integration on set um, mm -hmm. between in integrating practical set and the virtual set. For sure. Yeah, the uh, we're working very closely with Epic uh, all the time uh, to uh, help inform them what we need on the, on the stage as opposed to what um, as opposed to what basically a video game would need because this is this really is just a it it's a video game engine and because of the advancements in the GPU power over the years it is able to render a more high fidelity image at the moment uh, lumen is one of the biggest the biggest ones right now and what lumen is is a uh, a, glo a real time global illumination and when I was talking earlier about all that light bouncing uh, that uh, off, it's what we get for free in the real world, but in the computers, we don't get it for free. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, light extra, all the light bouncing all over the scene. Uh, Lumen is, that's one thing that they've been working with to make that real time. 
Now it is real time to a degree on a single on a single system. Uh, there's still a lot of if you're watching closely, and this is where uh, when we're shooting on a volume, if you're watching closely, you, you can see it rebuild itself. Uh, so lights that if you move your camera, then it, everything has to rebuild. You'll see the light sort of populate and render itself. Um, we're when things like that, they work great with a single GPU. But when we're talking multiple GPUs in one computer plus multiple computers that are displaying the images on the wall, and we have to sync all of those things together, uh, this is where they're uh, they're still working on that to make it make it uh, work well for uh, large environments, um, and that's I, I shouldn't just say large environments, but to work. To work well, so you don't have any artifacts on the wall. That's the uh, that's the biggest thing. Is we sometimes we've been doing a lot of testing with it as well, and finding the limitations at the moment, and uh, they're pretty drastic right now. <laughs> right. So. Are there any um, like practical troubleshooting things? Like, do the wall does the wall ever overheat? Does it make a lot of noise when it's doing its wall thing? You know, are there any Things like that to consider? Uh, there are fans on the wall itself, and that's part of our standard maintenance is to clean the filters, uh, basically. So right. there is, there's probably a, uh, um, I'm not an audio expert, so, but there's probably a little bit of fan noise uh, in the studio, uh, but that's uh, pretty minimal uh, unless you don't clean your filters, uh, mm -hmm. then it gets loud. <laughs> um, but as far as other noise, yeah, we haven't had any issues with overheating, really. Um, it's, you know, if you know, within reason, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, because we're we're pushing our our biggest thing that we worry about overheating is our our GPUs, the graphics cards. Uh, but we've been talking to NVIDIA and they're like, yeah, you're running it at fine speed, fine temperatures. Don't worry about it. You know, but that. Uh, we in our first stage, uh, we didn't have an air conditioning at the stage, and that was tough on the people. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> is there like a limit uh, it, to like how like is it shorter days? Is it you know for 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 the crew and and you know actors and stuff? Is there anything of like looking at screens or is there any you know what I mean like any sort of like downside in terms of looking at screen? I Not think so there's, far. there's there's one thing that we find that is that when we're changing a set, a virtual set, um, you know, some of the benefits mm -hmm. of virtual production include includes that we can change our our set really quickly if we're doing a changeover from morning to afternoon and we're going to a different location. And if we don't announce to someone that's standing in the middle of the stage, hey, we're changing the set, it can be really disorienting, right. um, especially if we're spinning the set. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. otherwise, I don't believe we've ever had a, a scenario where someone has found some downside to it in that realm. Um, the um, one downside- We uh, did We did when there's a lot of motion going on in the wall um, mm -hmm. that depending on the person, you, you can, there's some vertigo that could happen for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we would, uh, well, we'd reduce, either reduce the uh, time that that motion is happening, keeping it to with, within the take kind of thing, uh, but, and stop, not have it just going crazy all the time. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's more on a case by case basis in that respect. Um, and there was, uh, there... yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. That's what you're saying. Oh, I was just going to say, there was a question in the chat about that uh, too, uh, about, keeping the if the outer projection if is that disorienting to people and there are techniques we use to we say freeze the outer projection but we're not freezing the environment we're just stopping the motion of it and so then the actors are looking at something that's a little more static and then what's mm -hmm. behind them is where the frustum is and that's where the all the movement is happening behind them so the, generally they don't you don't they don't see that part going on so awesome. that helps in uh, reducing them reducing any vertigo. Well, I'd love to power through a bunch of questions that have come in mm. uh, just, uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, so I'm let's do a lightning round. I'll just keep throwing them at you and you guys can <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get to Syed in a, in a second. So Syed, get your uh, get your hair and makeup ready. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Um, one great question is, you know, can you, do the, does everyone have to stand in the exact middle or can you do a walking scene? How, how close can the actors get to the wall? You can do a walking scene. Um, we have done it. Uh, in our larger volumes, uh, you can walk you know, quite a ways. Uh, in the smaller volume, like where Chris is right now, there are other ways to, <clears throat> pardon me, get around it. If you're doing a walking scene and you want a wide shot where your practical floor and the wall need to match up, then you're limited basically by the depth of the volume itself. Yeah. Because to get the, if you're seeing that, that seam between practical and digital, then you're limited by the, well, you're limited by the practical set and the practical size of the volume. Uh, we've done other shots where it's a more of a, a medium, like a medium shot where you're not seeing the ground uh, anymore in the real world. And you can actually put, you, we've put people on um, uh, treadmills. That's, that's the mm. word for it. Uh, and then we match the uh, the speed that the volume, that the wall behind the volume is moving to the people that are in the foreground. So your camera stays static your actor is on a treadmill walking and then the vol the background is just moving behind him. It's sort of like an old uh, yeah. real projection, basically. You know, on the shoot, the shoot we did in Toronto at one point, one of the actors was standing in this, you know, below the Eiffel Tower on this road and the director goes, keep going back. And she's like, I'm yep. against the wall. <laughs> yeah. But he couldn't, he couldn't tell because it looked like it kept yep. going. Um, we've had the same we've had the same thing happen shooting as yeah. well yeah directors like keep going keep going and it's like i, I can't <laughs> um, That's awesome. right, i'm gonna i'm gonna uh bring in syed and just ask a quick question while he's coming uh on but uh is there any restriction to the type of cameras like as far as global shuttle or rolling shutter type so far uh at this point the majority of the our tv series and film productions have shot either airy or venice um, we have shot red on the wall as well. Uh, we've on in our own personal testing, we've done uh, DSLRs as well, uh, which is the rolling shutter problem. You still run into rolling shutter standard rolling shutter issues with a rolling shutter camera. Uh, but as long as we can and we can adjust our walls or we uh, the sync of the wall to the camera um, or we can gen lock the camera to the wall. Uh, so then we can get perfect sync there. So that's not an issue. You, uh, with so it is a possibility, but with rolling shutter, you're going to get standard rolling shutter issues. Um, it is always worth a camera test. Always worth a camera mm -hmm. test. All right, um, Syed, uh, what's your question? Might need to. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question is uh, regarding uh, the dust thing, which uh, might ruin the uh, the screen. Uh, I'm when, sorry. when we are it's, when it's, when we are uh, uh, using the foreground uh, through our direction department. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's the I missed the first part of the question. Uh, so I am talking about uh, what what might what issue might arise for screens when we are shooting and when we are also using the foreground uh, with the help of the art direction departments. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, there's no, no a, problem. A couple, a couple of uh, immediate items, which is, you know, um, we uh, um, we must uh, understand what is being built by art department because it can get in the way of our motion capture array. We need to be very informed of what items might be blocking the motion capture cameras from communicating with the camera, um, as we have infrared sensors that are going back and forth on, um, to make sure that the, the placement of that camera is still communicating appropriately in the mocap volume. That's that's you know when when massive set pieces are getting in the way, but um, that's rare. And as long as we know about it up front, we can augment our motion capture array to affirm that the the volume is is going to be successful. Um, on the other side of things, um, you know, Phil, we've had we've had a couple of shoots where sometimes the fog, the volumetric fog, has been a little too heavy, um, and it flattens the mm -hmm. screen. Um, it flattens the depth. And then otherwise, the foreground element is so imperative to making this work. Um, foreground important. and midground elements prior to the wall is help. It helps us essentially create the, the illusion and hide any um, anything that might give away that uncanny valley. Um, mm -hmm. Now we've had a couple of scenes where um, you know we had red clay and 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 dust, and we've had to wipe down the the screen sometimes because they can interrupt the 
the, the quality of the LED panel as the, the, the pixels get a little dirty, we just wipe them down. Um, but as long as the art department is building something um, in um, collaboration with the virtual art team, um, there's some really great um, approaches to foreground elements that play mm. very, very nicely. Um, mm -hmm. with with the uh, virtual art. And we can also recreate yeah. whatever the art department's building by scanning it and, and generating a digi double of it, which then affirms that, you know, repeatable nature of a set, which which um, really blends the two scenes together. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that's always very important uh, with our with the floor blend as well when you're in your wider shots is we'll, we'll go to uh, with the art department and find the, know the find the materials that they're using and we'll go and as Chris said we'll scan it we'll get photo reference of it and then we'll recreate their the same floor in the virtual world <laughs> and generally what we're do uh, what we do on a what we call a blend day which is basically a pre light day is we're making sure that the practical light that is going to be on the set is going to be matching what's in the uh, in the virtual as well and we're adjusting our textures and our and so on to match the floors together um there are as uh i think chris is pointing out that's where a blend point is uh, correct me if i'm wrong chris <laughs> correct. um but uh so there's a the blend between the physical and the digital um and as chris said this the only way this is successful is if the physical uh, is on the set as well, um, because if you just have a black floor, it, it doesn't really work out so well. So that's where the collaboration between uh, the physical and the digital is very important. And yeah. in this case, what we're showing with uh, in this, this is one was from the previous DGC uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. So there was a practical light that uh, was used in the real world. And we recreated it in the digital world. So you have that, you know, that repetition, basically. Uh, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be repetition, but you have the similarities is really the way I should put that. Uh, so in the virtual and the digital, or pardon me, the virtual, the digital, the physical and the digital <laughs> are the more you can put, use the same elements, the better, the better the blend works and the better the effect works as well. So and again, using um, even on the practical stage, we do have some uh, atmosphere that we put on the practical stage, so a little bit of smoke. Uh, but you do run into the same issues you would in the real world. If you have too much smoke, then your background blacks lift and they get kind of milky and it it gets le you lose your contrast. So you do have to be careful with that. Awesome. And we do we do put it in the background too. So thank you, Sayed. Great question. Uh, let's get uh, Santos. Uh, if I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, on deck. And uh, quickly, there's a few people asking, like, could you do a hockey game? Could you do ice? Could you put water in the stage and do a boat? Uh, what what could you do on the floor that you have? Are there any limitations to that? Some limitations we run into are with the wall panels themselves. Uh, so depending on the panel, some of them you can't get wet. So you got to be careful with that. Um, the panels we have, uh, they're they're the wall panels that is are indoor rated these this is changing depending every time there's a new uh new panels coming out uh so we've we've had we've had explosions on stage we have fire we've got lots of smoke we've had um snow um not real snow but the the bubble snow so that's not a problem we've had to watch out with the bubbles because sometimes they land on the wall and they give you a little magnetic or magnetic a magnifying effect on the wall so we have to mm. wipe the wall down but um we can't spray water on them, but we have had water on stage. Um, we've had puddles on the stage, not a problem. Uh, it gives you kind of cool reflections from things as well. Um, water in a simulating water in the wall is is a that's a that's a big question all the time uh, to shoot water for real. Um, that really comes down to the processing power that's available because simulating water in the computer is expensive uh yeah. and i mean time-wise so you basically you're gonna you'll get like a one frame a second sometimes depending on how visually good you make it look <laughs> the yeah. better you make it look the more processing power it's going to take and the hockey rink i mean that sounds like an awesome challenge <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it depends on the type of ice but i'm sure we could freeze something and shoot it, put yeah. it shoot on there. It, uh... Open the bay doors and just shoot in the middle. Just of the open track. the doors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
All right, Santos. Uh, yes. Santosh. Yeah, yeah, I'm audible. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a question with uh, Christopher Kauf. Like, so I'm sorry to mispronounce your name. First of all, like, like so basically, I'm a CG generalist. Like, uh, so I have a knowledge about Unreal, and uh, I want to become an Unreal engine operator on set. So, is it mandatory to learn about blueprint stuff? And uh, what what is the what is what's the exact pathway to get into Unreal Engine operator? Even I know the light how to pick the light, so how to, with the optimization workflow. So here we are following in the mill. So so I don't yeah. have a clear picture about the volume-based work. Uh, a great question. Also, you pronounced my name perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if, um, if, if, you, if you're a CG generalist, you have a foundation right already and, and a lot of our virtual art department um uh, content that goes into the engine starts from traditional softwares i mean most of most of um items are being uh, most props are starting to be built in in maya and and the geometry is agnostic i mean we can run an obj or an fbx into unreal engine but as a pathway to operating on set there are many opportunities and options for you. Um, um, Epic has uh, the Unreal Fellowship, which is a course online that offers um, guidance and, and, and tools for, for folks to find their way into Unreal Engine. And then you have your pathway of being an artist versus being an operator. So there's plenty of resources online for that. Um, CERT has uh, some education programs as well for onset um, 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 uh, sorry, education and operation between motion capture technicians to Unreal Engine uh, technicians. Um, in terms of your question regarding, um, actually, and continuing the education side of it, Pixamundo has a virtual production academy. It's called the VPA that's launching to for, for uh, that has a curriculums um, being available for a variety of different paths as well. Um, so plenty of resources online for that. Um, but I think if you're going to talk about some foundations, being a CG generalist is, is great already. But um, on site, if you're going to be an Unreal Engine operator for a production, you really need to understand the traditional uh, set um, communication structure, what it is to operate in a traditional set. Um, it really is a department that is on uh, on set that's just servicing a production. Virtual production should bend and, and fit into this industry. Um, so having some set etiquette, understanding set life, um, and then also having some skill sets in traditional art, uh, composition, lighting. We find a lot of successful artists that um, um, find their way to set come from fine arts, painting, photography, um, understanding composition. So if you can work towards your fine art skills to then operate on set, blueprint knowledge is not definitively required to be a good operator. Um, it comes with the, the atmosphere or the environment as you find your way into it. Um, but we really need artists first. Um, we, there's technical operators there to support, but this is art. We need to make sure that the, the content is, is suitable to the production that's on site um, and that we're more malleable to their creative requirements. So, you know, honing your traditional skills in composition and lighting. I would say if you're going to choose a path, if you, you want to be more of an artist, you go that route. If you go towards you do want to be a technical um, operator. Yes, you'll need to learn some blueprint skills. It's not uh, an imperative you, um, requirement. Can you explain, Chris, just quickly uh, what blue what blueprints are in relation to Unreal? Because most people probably don't understand that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I can do that. Go ahead. Oh, go so. ahead. Yeah, basically, a blueprint is a uh, it's a visual programming language uh, or visual program. Not a, it's kind of a language. Uh, it basically allows you to create. Uh, systems in Unreal that, it, uh, like if-then statements, if you want to think of it that way. So you can create a a, a program with a visual uh, set of blocks and key, uh, things that you can put together to make something happen in the environment or to change things. So it's basically a programming language, if you will. Awesome. Uh, last few questions. How close can things get to the wall? Can the camera focus on the wall? Can someone be standing right next to the wall? Can a prop be right next to the wall? What are the sort of proximity things to the wall? Um, a lot of that is dependent upon, uh, there's a, a number of different things. The pixel pitch of the wall is one. That's probably the biggest. Uh, but that relates to the sensor of the camera, the lens you're shooting with, and the distance of the camera from the wall. Generally, uh, we're, we like to say, try to keep your camera about at least eight to 10 feet from the wall. 
you're if you're focusing directly on the wall and the size of the pixels on the wall start to match up with the size of the pixels in your camera sensor and that's where the lens sensor relationship comes from then you're going to get that more a pattern so and the easiest way to get rid of it is you either just pull your camera a little bit further away or you just if you don't want to move your camera you, you might have to change rack your focus a bit to get the wall out of focus uh, so there are some physical limitations there yes so it's going to depend on the wall it, not every wall is going to be the same and, and it's not going to behave the same with every single camera and lens Cool. I'm going to ask a, a question of my own to wrap up um, for, for, each, for each of you. You've done a lot of different stuff on the wall. You've seen a lot of crazy stuff on the wall. What if you had to pick your biggest wow moment of just kind of losing, losing the ability to speak and gone, holy shit, I cannot believe what I'm seeing right now. What was that moment? Great question. Hmm. There's been a couple. <laughs> um I, I think what it is is uh for me it's as we uh, we've we've gotten a lot we've progressed a lot let's put it that way so like every environment that comes up there's something new that we've been able to do and being able to get there um it's like getting into the uh like the, the photo real stuff is the biggest thing for me and that's the that getting that up on the wall and seeing it through the camera and you're just like holy crap this actually worked you know because mm. <laughs> there's been weeks and weeks that you've been spending on on building these and, and doing tests and so on and then until you get the camera on stage and and the actual practical lighting and the actors in there and then you're saying yes it's actually working yeah it works you know we knew it was going to work but now you're it, it's the biggest thing for me it's getting in more um it's getting a more natural movement uh, into the wall. That's that's the the biggest thing, like getting some action going on in the background. And that's, uh, that's uh, so before it was limited, we're getting more, more and more of the ability to add more and more of that. So that for me is probably the biggest thing. Yeah, when, 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 a, when a, I've had one where tr the, the production designer, the art department loaded in, you get, and you were seeing the Unreal Engine, the virtual production, the virtual art department asset on Zoom calls and reviews and at the office and that sort of thing. And then when the art department loaded in on one of our assets on Avatar The Last Airbender, and we were shooting on um, our other volume in, in Vancouver, which at the time was the world's largest. I think we got dethroned. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just so big, but you're still seeing the reviews without art department, without the the traditional and, and physical propping and everything in there. And then they come in, and they 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 do their work, their beautiful art that they put on the set. And then when it when all of a sudden it just blends and it just works, and you think I've completely left this world and I'm wherever I am in the world now because of virtual production, because of the art department, it it is shocking when that happens. And Star Trek and Strange New Worlds do it all the time too. Every production does it all the time where we're physically transported to a different place the moment that both worlds come together. And I think yeah. that there's kind of like this weird irony to it where there's like these separate worlds that are working and then the worlds come together and then you're transported. And it's so cool having that moment every time over and over. Like there's that wow factor that I get to keep having when the production team and the art department comes in produces their beautiful work and combines it with the virtual art department's beautiful work. And then it's like worlds collide and it's amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. we got to wrap up and get to our next panel. Thank you, Lisa Rose, so much for, for moderating. Chris Cox, Phil Jones, great to see you as always. Thank you for being leaders in the industry and we'll, we'll, we'll see you soon. Um, thank you, everybody. We're going to be moving on to our next panel. Yeah, appreciate uh, it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Thank Lovely work. Bye-bye. Our next panel after a quick interstitial is going to be about previs and the virtual arts department or the VAD, as you've been hearing, and all the different workflows that lead from the idea to getting to the point where it's on the stage, basically what Chris was just talking about. What are all the elements that work with the virtual art department, the real art department? How do you previs that? How do you get notes on that? How do you build it out? How do you get it to the point where it's all on stage and it's all blended and working well? So. You definitely want to stick around for that. We've, we've had 250 of you here all day so far. So I know you don't really get a sense of, of the of the room, but you're all here kicking ass. Um, <laughs> first, we're just going to play a quick interstitial uh, from Versatile Media, which is a, a vendor 
in Vancouver on a uh, sequence that they did um, with a car crash. So hit it on that clip.我就还是晚一些别打了amazing uh i love the part where they turn the camera upside down and the actors just put their arms up in the air and it makes it look like the cars flipped over but really it's just the environment that's flipped over um we're gonna be hearing a lot from versatile later um for now we're you can see why previs is so important and that's what we're going to be talking about next uh we have two moderators uh for this next panel dylan pierce who's a canadian uh, Screen Award winning director. He's gone on to direct films and TV shows for Hallmark, Lifetime, Amazon. He's also won a Lumiere Award at Warner Brothers uh, for direct for his work in 3D. Uh, he's also going to be co-hosting this panel with uh, Andrew, who, uh, who is a producer for the last 16 years in the film industry, including interactive digital media. Uh, he's also a recipient of the Lumiere Award. I'm curious if it was together. Uh, he's produced and sold nine feature films uh, over 100 different countries with uh, theatrical releases. Um, he acts as a consultant for virtual production, has worked uh, for Beamdog, building a new virtual production department to support the development and creation of intellectual property. Um, thank you so much, Dylan and Andrew, for uh, hosting this incredible panel. You've got a lot of esteemed guests to, uh, to introduce and, and kick us off, so uh, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, we're, we're really excited for this panel. Uh, it's, it's an incredible lineup. Um, so we'll, we'll, jump, we'll jump right into it. Uh, first, we'll introduce um, Asad. Asad spearheads the content development for Pixelmondo's virtual production stage, squeezing feature quality imagery out of Unreal Engine. Asad has worked on such titles as Star Trek, Strange New Worlds, Star Trek Discovery, and Halo and he co-developed Pixamondo's virtual production visit with a sprinkle of game development on occasion. Welcome, Asad. 
Thank you, Andrew. Next is uh, Muja. Muja has worked on such shows as The Mandalorian, Star Trek Discovery, and Westworld, as well as prestigious studio IP, including Wonder Woman, Power Rangers, Hunger Games, and Fast and the Furious. Uh, now Muja has taken the role of Pixamondo's Toronto's head of virtual art department and art director, bringing many of PXO's virtual production environments to life for the virtual for the volume stage. Welcome, Muja. Hi, nice to meet you, everybody. I'm Muja. Good to see everybody. Uh, next is Steve. Steve co-founded One Animation, which became one of Singapore's leading animation studios, developing fully. CGI TV series. Before that, Steve worked on various live action, fully animated feature films, including Happy Feet with the Animal Logic in Australia, incorporating motion capture for animation. And he's the marketing and business development executive at Versatile Media. Welcome, Steve. Hi, uh, nice to meet everyone. It's great to join the panel. Awesome. And next we have uh, Matt. Matt has been designing worlds and helping create scripted entertainment for over 20 years. His early work includes designing sets on series such as The Strain, The Expanse, uh, and features including Pacific Rim, Crimson Peak, and Suicide Squad. Uh, he's a supervising art director at Star Trek Discovery, where he's helping transition the show into a virtual production space and forging new paths for that. <clears throat> Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Andrew, and nice to meet you, Dylan, and nice to see everyone else again. Next is Kevin. Um, Kevin is an Emmy and BES uh, award nominated VFX VP supervisor located in Toronto. Recent supervision credits include The Good Lord Bird, um, Briar Patch, What We Do in the Shadows, Charmed, Brams, uh, Boy 2, uh, Big Gold Brick, Nine Films About Technology on Set. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Uh, just to finish that up, Kevin is the head of virtual production house. Um, it's a new volume located in Vancouver. Next is Mr. Richard. Where's my list here? Rich Richard is the vice president of and creative services and executive producers at Mel's Montreal. Um, they're two years into virtual production, and uh, he's really passionate about previs, tech viz, and and uh, really wants to show how that can um, promote and uh, set up uh, productions for success. So welcome, Richard. All right, um, well, do, we, do we have you there, Richard? Uh, yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Good space. Yeah. Um, well, let, let's straight into it. There, there's a lot to cover. Um, one of the things um, let, let's start off with is <clears throat> what is Previs and why is it so successful to virtual production? Um, I thought, Muja, do you want to start off? Sorry, I was muted. But uh, yeah, indeed, uh, Previs is incredibly important and covers mm -hmm. so many different areas. For virtual produ production, especially, uh, we want to spend a lot of our time in the beginning working with directors, production designers, and all the key creatives to figure out what are we building, flagging any issues very, very early on. And the process of previsiting is for us to sit with the PN to look through potential shots to cover what kind of story points they want to hit. And in order to uh, present in Unreal Engine, similar camera lensing info that they were going to be working with so that when they get to the shoot on the day, they wouldn't be surprised. We have already looked at the environment and figured out where exactly it's going to be filmable, where are we going to put all our energy in, and what limitations there are, what can we cannot do uh, very early on. So it's an incredibly uh, collaborative process and very, very important. Um, and during the same stage, we also get to do the concept and looking at what are we actually going to make. So all that process, I guess, is part of pre that environment. Great, thanks, Lucia. We want to add on that or? Uh, I've got a little um, uh, sort of B-roll footage I can show that shows to the extensive level that we go here at Versatile. Um, am I okay? Is it okay for me to share my screen and, and Please throw do. a quick yeah, video? You should be good to go. Excellent, thank you. Um, oh, I think I'll take the sound off. 
Um, I think you guys can see my screen now. Mm -hmm. This is uh, an example of sort of the level of visualization that we do here at Versatile. We kind of we use motion capture, we use Unreal integration, VCAMs, um, we record audio. Essentially what we're trying to do is, is make the film before we actually make it. There you can see uh, the Unreal environments projected into our mocap stage. So our actors feel a little bit more immersed in the process as they go through it. We've developed all kinds of tools that enables directors to give kind of very quick feedback. This is the performance capture stage where we're capturing and trying to tell the story based on the script with the directors, DPs and the editors input to really kind of make your film before you go to make your film. Um, so we put an extensive amount of work in developing tools to do this in a very fast and iterative process um, to really get your exploration of story out of the way. The next big phase after this comes TechViz, where it's, you're kind of working out how are you going to film this. And at this point, we'll have accurate cameras, accurate movement for those cameras, the lensing's done. Um, we can even then work out whether robot technology used on volume is going to be helpful in the clip you saw prior uh, to this talk kicking off was one of those examples of how we use robots on set. So we try and cover everything from what is ex what the expectations of your VAD is, what is the story you're trying to create, explore the different shots. We take our previs um, really as seriously as we do our, our principal photography stages. So uh, yeah, it's 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 and and the sooner you can be involved and have buy-in from your directors and DPs, it makes a, a measurable distance uh, difference when you're uh, working on volume. I think so. That's one of the key areas that that we take as serious as possible. That's great. Thanks, Stephen. It sort of leads into the next question, which is what's uh, the mindset and or how quickly do you get involved in a production uh is, is script you know before the script is complete uh and and what are maybe some conversations that um a producer director could be expected to have in those early ages um kevin do you want to tackle that yeah absolutely um so one of the things with uh with our team is we often are working on a lot of commercials short form indie films um, particularly with the commercials, that's really set the pace for how we like to be brought on board. That is, the obvious answer is as early as possible, um, but really it yeah. comes down to exploring things, especially when there's, you know, something like an AT or uh, client crave involved, being brought on board before anybody's really overly married to a specific camera move or shot. Um, you know, once reference is introduced, that's moving and doing things, it's, it's pretty hard to, to pull away from that. There's always a way to get a shot, but one is a preconceived notion of, this is how we're gonna do it. You know, we've seen a clip, we've seen another production, we're gonna do the same. It, it can be a little bit challenging. Um, so certainly if we're more at a conceptual stage, that's great, but uh, you know, that's not always realistic as people are, you know, vetting their various options. Um, but as soon as they feel comfortable or it really is on the table as a, a possibility, we like to be brought on board at least we can start doing our own homework on our side so that we can be as confident as possible in what we're going to be delivering. Does anybody want, want to add to that? Um, well, sure. Uh, let's, start with Kevin. Richard. Richard. let's start with Richard there. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, we actually, we do, we did a lot of commercial past year and uh, funny enough or good enough, we actually have been involved with the ad agency and even the, uh, the advertiser itself. So we've been involved at the very beginning. So the onboarding was really good. And we talk about previs a lot, but it's more like part of the digital production process. So I think that's how we're successful way before shoot day to actually bring everybody on board. So you do have that discussion if it's going to be uh, physical or practical or, or if going to if we're going to bring 10 ton of sense as an example on the last shoot that's what we had to share. so um but you know it was it's really helpful during that process of pre-production or we say previous but now it's more for us just pre-pro and so we have a good handshake between the physical production what is actually really truly digital and during that process, well, we have to actually communicate with the DP, the physical set designer. We have to exchange a lot of files. 
and so on and so forth. So that process for us as well include Okadev. So during, during that period of set building, physical and otherwise, we will do the dailies through the camera. So we don't share just the asset or the digital asset that we're actually building. We're sharing the digital asset that we're building through the lens. So the entire crew or production people or client can actually see, start to see what it looks through the lens. So there's no surprise when they come to shoot the, the shoot day. Um, if I, if I, I could share quick images of the previs and uh, this way. So here's here's a previs we did for um, Intel commercial and the set was done all in SketchUp and we've imported the SketchUp into our uh, pipeline obviously. And this was done in collaboration with the physical set designer and this was all done and shared with uh, the Intel folks as we were actually doing this. So that, that was actually the previs. And this way we determined what was actually going to be built physically and what was going to be digital. Um, and uh, if we can skip quick to the finished commercial, you'll see uh, where, where we go from a previs to, you can see there's actually, other than it's finished, uh, there's not big difference in terms of the set design, all the decision we we'll make. So all this was almost pre pre directed before we showed up on on set. So thank you for uh, showing that. Um, so yeah, so that's that's how we deal previs. We take it from the top, and it helps communicate. That's great. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Appreciate the visuals as well. Um, Matt, you had uh, maybe quite a bit to add there. Yes. Uh, building on what everyone's said before, uh, on a big show like Star Trek, the previous has only been there uh, developing in past seasons prior to getting to virtual production. And it functions for all intents and purposes the same way as it would for creating a very large studio set or a set created on a location or incorporating a lot of uh, VFX extensions that happen in green screen. Only now uh, that VFX extension is happening uh, real time live. But it starts out with the creative, and it's driven by the creative, the words on the uh, on the page with the script. And we have early meetings with the showrunner and the directors to determine what the needs are creatively, and the production designer is leading that. And then we. Uh, Start a conversation with the uh, Pixel team, with the virtual art department. We talk the best way to break that down. And sometimes we'll be working on location for part of a sequence. We'll be bringing elements into a stage. We'll be working with further elements or parts of that world or ship or setting uh, on the volume. So the previs goes through a number of stages. It starts with idea development, with research and early conceptual design in 3D and in 3D. And then it starts getting into a model. We try to get a cop lock quickly with a couple of weeks to know what ballpark we're in. And that's communicated in a meeting with the virtual art department. And they can start pulling together uh, similar assets or environments or generally working on the approach to realize that on the, on the volume, uh, while our internal concept artists will be continuing with the development and working with the set designers to map out the space, usually with uh, a very simple sort of grayscale model uh, that maps out the overall volumes, the spatial relationships, and we start to hone in on what the, um, the live action space is going to be, the hotspot, or it's known by a number of names. And We'll also, in those early conversations, talk about the timeline. And for these large volume, large spaces, that can mean up to 21 weeks. Sometimes it's even gone a little longer. It can go uh, shorter than that if we really are, are under a crunch. Um, but it, it can also be requiring less time if it's not a fully 3D immersive space. Um, so yeah, I think we can talk about this more, but it starts as early as you can, that tight integration, and it continues that integration all the way up to the point that you shoot, 
and then you're into the VFX pipeline as well. I just want to quickly add to that exactly as Matt is mentioning. So in the very beginning, when we're just looking at scripts, sometimes it, the script hasn't even been written yet. We have regular conversations with the art department and all the key creatives will talk about what potentially would happen in the script. And then they would actually ask us for input is that actually going to be shootable on the wall? Should we adjust it? Is there any of the story points that we're going to bring up to drive up the cost that we need to worry about? Can we do a lot of water up close to camera? Is foliage okay? Uh, can we trigger all these events that we actually need to happen in these stories? And if the answers with any kind of concerns we would have, that's the type of conversation we would have and bringing up flagging all the issues and then they'll say, okay, oh, I see. Then the writers will actually go and rewrite and adjust to something that would be shootable or would look effective. Or alternatively, we could even come back and suggest, by the way, we've done this test on a different show. We have examples from that. Can we show you guys, take a look? And then that would actually inspire them to say, oh, I haven't thought about that. Maybe we can put people on the gimbal. Uh, maybe we can trigger these effects. And uh, that would actually influence how the story gets written. So we have like uh, in a week, sometimes like three, four days just with calls to communicate that type of ideas. And we find that uh, it's been happening more and more frequent with our um, recent productions on Star Trek uh, Discovery and Stranger Worlds. And it's super, super useful. Awesome. Appreciate that. Steve, it sounds like you have a quick point as well. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, it's it really is about trying to get that buy-in to keep reading it. It's direct deep. It's, um, nah. And, and sort of the more they invest in this, the, the much better experience you're going to have later in the volume shoot. Uh, because it just tests everything from story to cameras to how you want to tell that section of uh, of the whatever it is you're filming or planning in that scene, um, and and sort of being as prepared as you can. It tests your VAD work. It, it gives you your camera data. It enables you to plan what's going to be physical, what's digital. You know, as Matt was saying, we we really love it too when the 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 kind of set designers get involved and then start to influence how the VAD work and the digital side of things need to work. Um, and planning, you know, once you have your cameras laid out, you can start to understand um, how you're now going to film this in, and, and what, how many builds of a set are you going to need on volume to achieve that entire sequence. So it, it helps you in every single way, and in particular productivity, I think is still one of the biggest challenges today. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, but really into uh, the next question, uh, which selfishly I'm going to steer a bit more to the uh, directing um uh one of the one of the shoots andy and i were on um this idea of foreground and how that helped you blend the scene together as a director i i don't think a lot of directors fully understand how valuable important it is and besides when you get on a show um you often don't have the time to kind of learn or understand that you're just in the middle of it so is there is there any tools or tips you could give directors or production designers or dps um at that early stage of just how to understand the blend of how much foreground you need in previs um, or how a movement kind of affects it is, is there things there that they can utilize and be prepared for when they do get to the volume or the stage in previs that they're um, able to come with um, some questions and knowledge um anyway I'll, I'll go to Assad for that to start that off for sure um in a perfect world you're going to the stage as as possible with your equipment, looking at things through a lens. Obviously, that's not always possible. Uh, there are lots of tools in Unreal Engine to mimic cameras. So I can say, for example, early days, Star Trek. Uh, I know, Matt, we were talking about Kaminar Council Chamber uh, a little while back. Uh, so that's got a lot of foreground elements. In cases like those, uh, you would generally a, be consulting with your uh, team, whoever's building the content, whether that's your VAT supervisor, VFX supervisor, Pixo as a whole, anybody who's involved in that, uh, generally hop on a Zoom and then actually have representations 
digitally of what you have on set in Unreal and block in like uh, through Zoom, for example. You can do that uh, live and kind of, you know, annotate, guide an artist through that scene. That's one way of doing it. But ideally, if you have storyboards for those artists to work off of, you can kind of uh, block that in a more refined and, and polished manner. So you can see an edit at the end of the day. So kind of two directions you can go about it in that sense. Anyone else want to uh, add that? Yeah, Matthew, go ahead. I think it's important uh, for us to just acknowledge uh, just how there could be a sliding scale of how you approach uh, the use of a volume stage uh, with respect to how much physicality it has. You can shoot it with an actor just as a backing, and that'll get you a certain level of realism. You won't have the integrated feet with the environment, and it'll feel a little bit like it's just been comped there. Uh, but it can be effective for, you know, some close coverage and various shots or quick sequences. Um, the next level is you've got some foreground, some background, physical elements, and a limited degree of either masking or connection with the, uh, with the stage floor, the physical side. And then uh, the best level where we typically like to operate is a, a fully immersive stage set. Uh, that complete setting realized on the stage, supported by the extension of the background and supported by, you know, the talents of your construction, scenic, special effects, the grip and lighting, and having all those natural atmospherics, you know, a bit of drifting, drifting atmosphere, some fire, some water droplets on the ground. Um, some shows have used rain towers in the volumes, like... Um, uh, like over on uh, Dark Bay in, in Germany, they had rain towers. Uh, you have like physical moving elements that are within there and practical lights, uh, cued, cued displays or consoles, all those tricks, as much as you can bring that into your setting, uh, and create a more realistic space. Not all shows have the uh. budget, or time or the necessity to go to the full extent. But um, it's important to not think of the wall itself as a solution. It integrates with a very uh, traditional, fully fleshed out production. Yeah, that's great. Um, thinking about like flags, issues, uh, things we'd want to sort of note early in, um, for example, interactivity with a background element, lighting, those sort of things. Maybe you could just build out on that or, or why that might be a challenge and, and how to some of the approach a script and to sort of see some of the maybe problematic areas early on. Um, Asad, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, totally. Um, so I know for sure, uh, Phil, I think if anyone was here for the previous session mentioned blueprinting in Unreal. Um, so Unreal is a game engine at the end of the day. Uh, those of us coming from traditional BFX, we're used to uh, spending eight hours rendering a single frame or sending something to a farm and, and just letting it sit there. So usually we don't have to think too much about optimizing things so they can run at 24 frames per second. It's a big jump. In, in rendering power um, and not so much rendering power in a game engine's case, but finding shortcuts to get the same image you would get in a traditional VFX sense. So kind of things that we would probably flag, uh, a popular one is lighting. So uh, getting your interactive lighting in there is, is a big thing that comes up in almost every production. Um, you, you would, in a traditional production, be used to operating the lights on your set with a DMX board. Same thing with like a concert. And to do that in game engine, it's very similar, except now you have the freedom to do that with lighting, but you also have the freedom to do that with the natural elements of the world in that scene. So mountains in the background, crowds, skies, it can get very exciting uh, for folks, you know, just think about all those possibilities. So that's why it's so important to flag that up front because uh, associated with each of those elements is a, a computational cost. So uh, you would need to give, uh, at least in Pixmondo, we're uh, calling a technical artist, you would give your technical artists a chunk of time dedicated to 
optimizing that thing that's interactive to the point that it can run smoothly on the wall and not kind of hitch in camera while you're shooting. But uh, but yeah, uh, that's that's interactivity for us. We like to flag any and every interactive elements that that's going to make way into the scene, starting with lighting. Then we covered it there or anything we're missing. <laughs> Awesome. Well, next thing I want to do is sort of jump into um, this might be more from well, I think it be from, from all of you. But how do we set clients clients up for success? Um, what are some things to to consider early on? I know we've touched on some things, but I, I think it's just so important in, in managing managing those expectations and, and how to approach um, you know those those first early conversations. Um, so yeah, what, what are some things that we can prepare uh, the, the the listeners today? Um, with that, does anyone want to kick us off? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm glad to go. Yeah. Um, so the, the biggest thing, you know, whenever we're dealing with or working with a new client, getting a realistic sense of where they are at in their planning, um, what resources are available, and also where they need to arrive. Those are the three pillars that, that set the realistic nature of the that we're going to have to take. Um, there's always a different way for us to move through. We wanna make sure that we are the best fit for what they realistically need. So big thing, if you're looking at a virtual production solution is asking what is the actual benefit uh, for this production in, in particular. So sometimes, you know, the big one is cost um, and then that, that might feed in nicely to the, the financial resource. Sometimes it is um, the, the realistic nature of an environment or the safety um, that that might outweigh, those concerns might outweigh that. Um, really getting a sense of what they're trying to walk away with and why they're looking at this approach. And you can really steer into that then. Um, and that can really help with things like not over-engineering the solution. So, you know, you, you know, in the last set of questions when we were touching on uh, foreground elements, there's the temptation to build each and every inch of it in the same way we would a video game. So, you know, you can really get in there and explore, but you can, it's also a way to burn a lot of capital really fast on something that's never going to end up on screen and really what the camera is seeing is it, it that that is the that's everything you know walking away and getting your your edit uh is is all that really matters uh, as far as deliverables everything leading up to that can help that um but it's also what the other point i would make to that is it's also why it's really important to tread lightly in terms of these are really exciting new tools it's very easy to create something, for lack of a better word, that looks cool or is exciting and gets a buy-in. Um, the only thing is you also don't want to create any culture of distraction. That is, look how neat this looks. And then you get there on a production day and the repeatability of that isn't there or the, the feasibility of it wasn't there. You know, you're better off doing the the, uh, the slowest, steady and steadiest, fast approach. You know, create a nice dialogue at the onset of these are the types of dates that we feel could facilitate. These are the types of deliverables and things we could demonstrate on those dates and these are the types of feedback we would be looking for um not being more from the vendor side but from a client side if you're not receiving that then ask you know if there's no clarity as to what you're looking at somebody's dumping a really neat looking flashy vendor on you ask them what you should be uh what you should be paying attention to ask them if this is representative of what you're actually going to be getting or is it you know something just kind of interesting and neat uh it needs to facilitate and service the production because the production is trying to facilitate and service the story and that we're all here. And just to riff off on what Kevin's saying, couldn't agree more. I think the biggest uh, and most important thing is to work in context. Uh, often we would have sessions sitting with the DP or director to move things around to adjust lighting and layouts in the previous kind of stage. But then we have to take them to the stage and look at it in context of how much actually will be seen. Make sure that they look through a real camera with the real lens that they're going to be shooting so that they don't comment on things that will never be seen on the wall. It gets completely hidden by uh, where we're standing. So we focus our energy building the sections that will be visible. And so often we find that no matter what we do uh, with like a Zoom session with the client, you don't get the sense of depth and scale and get to the stage and you realize suddenly all the objects are much closer to us uh, because our real engine by default has the field of view much wider than what you would do with a normal camera. So just preparing them that what you're seeing now 
it's not very uh, exact, we might as well go to the stage. Then you can tell us to move that mountain over there uh, in more of the context that you're going to be shooting. And that that is crucial for success so that we don't spend all the time yeah, doing I, things that it's not even there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think um, uh, managing a client's expectation, you've got to really understand exactly what they're trying to create. And the more you can build into the pre-visualization workflow, the earlier you can start developing that with the client's buy-in as, as included in that process, I think is incredibly important. Because you, essentially what you're trying to do in a very cost-effective and quick environment is find the problems, find the issues you're going to have on set, on volume, understand the shots you want, get your real lenses. I mean, in Unreal, you can create a lens that mimics exactly what that lens will do uh, in the real world when you're on volume. So the more you can actually throw a pre-visualization process and the more um, of a complete process you put together, even to a point where we even feel audience testing can be done from a pre-visualization level. If you could actually watch sections of the film and the edit that you've put together and then make decisions as to how is that going to finish with an entire, you know, when you, you connect it to the film, the more prepared you are before you go to volume, the more problems you've found then your clients have a much better time uh, on set. You can manage their expectations a lot easier. Just to pull a question here from uh, oh. the audience. Um, uh, you know, big discussion has been what types of projects are using the volume. Um, is it just limited to action or sci-fi? I know Andrew and I are about to jump into a Christmas uh, hallmark using virtual production. Um, so... Um, from your side, what what are you seeing um, virtual production being used for? Is it is it limited to space and action, or um, but what types of uh, worlds are you in coming away? And maybe we'll go to Richard. Why don't you jump in to start oh, yeah, this I want, one? Yeah, I think I want to jump on that one uh, because you know our colleagues do a lot of great, amazing vis visual effect work, and I I think one of the thing we all want to get to is that uh, virtual production is 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 much more than visual effects and th that kind of show. So as you probably may, can tell already, I'm in a digital kitchen here, so on stage. So, and it's just a boring kitchen. And, you know, it's like, why, well, why would you use a digital boring kitchen? Well, you know, uh, time to prep this asset, which is not great, by the way. It's kind of uh, off the shelf asset. And I, we made the point to take this off the chef on set. It was a two day prep and we're shooting a kitchen. So if you're shooting a commercial and somebody wants to shoot a commercial there, it's a two week lead time. So you need to find something that can be put up all the wall very, very rapidly. So um, what we've been doing a lot here, uh, it's either because we're in Quebec or that's the client have been asking us or we're in a smaller market, but we've done a lot of just regular living room, kitchen stuff, uh, and with, you know, one week, two week lead time. And I want to go back to, you know, the topic, which is previs, but for us it's more prep, you know, it's like pre-pro. And of course, previs is a component that goes into this, but this is where like in this thing here, you can say, well, we, we need a physical plan here. And this is the back and forth between the digital and physical world on the build. So, and sometimes the, the time is so short and it's not like problems or risk for us. It's more, you know, um, you're building a sandbox and uh, go back to what Muja said, like, well, you know, you can, you can spend three days building this thing here, but it's not going to be uh, on cam. So it's just a waste of time. So I, th I think virtual production is getting more at the intersection of uh, MacGyver, real life and uh, VFX, you know, and sometimes just something as simple as we see here. Great, thanks, Richard. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add or? Awesome. Um, I thought, Matt, I, I wanted to ask a question, starting with you, and, and maybe we can expand off that. But what are some challenges, or, or maybe what are the 
uh, some learning curves that weren't expected um, in in the new style of communication. Obviously, there's all sorts of opportunities that that open up, but between you know the the director, the DP, production team, and and the virtual production, where are some uh, friction points that that tend to show up or different perspectives uh, that you may seem uh, you know a little bit of a rub on. Hey, let's see. The areas that are the challenges, I mean, a main one is the logistic challenge of getting all this to happen in the schedule uh, and get all these pieces working together with the digital deadlines, lining up the physical deadlines uh, amidst the changing pressures of a uh, an active dynamic shoot schedule that has other cast and setting pressures. So uh, we had to discover early, we had discovered early on that uh, you need to give it the time for all the planning and to get everyone in alignment. And that timeline uh, for us is months and it allows everyone to see it for those that haven't experienced it yet, to learn and to onboard themselves with the technology and their role within it. And for some departments, it's highly integrated. Um, for our, our grip and lighting department, they've got to be, you know, shooting, they've got to be doing their particular technical trade in that new changed environment. So they need to get power into the set, uh, either from above with pop panels or through the floor, through our, our riser. Um, for the lighting department, they have to understand all the uh, effects that the LEDs will have and the, the way that changes the shape of the light and the directionality of the light and how proximity affects things. Uh, for the grip department, they have a contained space that they need to operate in, so they can only come in through the same mouth that the rest of the crew is or up above uh, in the ceiling. But when you're actually shooting it, then you can't be doing a lot of movement, otherwise it might disrupt the sensors. So uh, they've got their challenges, costumes, hair and makeup, they have to understand it. And then of course, uh, DP, the directors, uh, they need to learn to work effectively, quickly within this space so that they can get their day in the day that you have it or the two days that you have that environment up. And then it is all coming out and you're not coming back ideally to do anything. It's not a standing set. So there's a big paradigm shift of uh, preparing uh, exquisitely for this highly choreographed activity that needs to happen. Unfortunately, the film industry is already set up for that. We have production planning schedules. We have the ADs on the day uh, orchestrating all the movements of the, of the various parts. And now we have the use of pre to coordinate those in a very visual way that's not pages on a script or a, a grid of a schedule, but something that everyone can immediately recognize and see and feel feel within their space, uh, feel themselves within the space. So it works itself into conceptual approval, into the blocking of actor movement, action and stunts, uh, the shot blocking with the directors where they can decide what they want that background to be in every shot. We, you know, for many, many of the directors they go in and they work with one of the set designers and have a, their own little uh, locking session or in larger meetings with, uh, with the VAD team and they'll pick their specific shots and make sure that the alignment, everything is going to work and could move that piece over a little bit because it's going to set this shot really nice when she's delivering this line or he's, doing that action. Um, so shot blocking is really important. Lighting development with the DP. Um, Muju was mentioning some things you're going to see on camera. Other things are uh, going to be beyond beyond your, uh, your view. So you want to be making sure that early on you're pre-visualizing, determining that what that lighting is going to be, the primary direction of the light. And if it's in the environment, how are you going to be physically lighting the set? Because you've got a wall there that's blocking things. 
sometimes we're popping a panel. Uh, the difficult things are getting hard light sources. And on our show, our directors uh, and the showrunners, they love a lot of hard backlight for this dramatic look. It's sort of a signature of the show. So if you're looking at an environment and there's a setting sun and you want the backlight of that setting sun, there's a real wall there that you can't physically put a light. So we've been exploring things like having a dynamic moving spotlight over top of where the sun is. And then as the camera moves and the position of the sun on the wall moves, there's a grip operated little sled with a grip stand on it that holds a light. And that's moving in real time, being puppeted, if you will, uh, to match that light. And that's the kind of thing that you have to be pre-visualizing that, look at the model, looking at your view, what are those angles going to be? Um, another complicated area that Previs has really been uh, working for us is in the planning of motion of gimbals, where we've got a set that's on gimbal, be it either a shuttle or another vehicle or um, some other moving object that a cast member is on. And being able to see that and what you're going to view out of that. I mean, we, we, we did a um, very interesting process with Pixel and they developed uh, in conjunction with our practical effects team, this customized solution where we had a moving gimbal tied to a pre-rendered environment where you're traveling through on a preset track, in this case, a couple of tracks uh, through an alien environment and all that pre-rendered footage is then being played back on the wall, synced up with the movement of the gimbal and with pre-planned camera moves on cranes and on, on sliders and such. And at the same time as your, your uh, subject is moving and turning, uh, the gimbal static, the camera's moving, the background is actually moving, but the hard source light was being executed by having a ring of lights. I think there were about 200 plus lights all surrounding the top edge of the of the wall. And they were cued to move that hard source by turning on and off and kind of traveling that source of light around, around the stage. So as simple as planning your shot to executing these highly complex uh, scenes and, and visions for the shot. I mean, Steve showed us a really fine example with that motion control rig and that, and that whole sequence all accomplished, you know, high, you know, multiple actions and traveling through an environment, and, uh, stunts and everything all accomplished in camera in, in a single moving shot. Unreal. You could have sold tickets to the audience. You could have just put a line out front and had people off the street, but you know, 50, 50 bucks a pop go flying. Getting the ride. Yeah. Yeah. Basically yeah. built an amusement ride. Yeah. A little, a little <laughs> button that just a little, uh, light that flashes on and says hands up now kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, cool. We have just a few more minutes to wrap up and get other uh, questions from the audience, but um, so we'll probably bring Anjali on in a second, but if anyone wants to, to comment on what Matt was saying, go ahead. I think the the car reference that, that Matt sort of led to, when you look at the amount of work that went into creating that sequence, I think the third of it on volume was probably only around two, two and a half hours. The amount of preparation work leading up to be able to achieve that is uh, was extensive. You know, it ran into weeks um, of planning first creative buy-off on exactly what you're trying to achieve, which is what our pre-visualization workflow is all about. And then once you've got that locked in and directors are happy with the sequence or the shots that they're putting together, then you've got to pull everything apart and work out how you're going to do it. And to Matt's point, there can be so many moving parts on a set from robot arms, the different light rigs you need to bring in to where you're going to be, how you're going to set this stage up with the foreground set pieces to enable you to achieve all of those cameras, or maybe that's not possible. And now you've got to plan second shoot adjustments to it. Um, it's all about preparation. And the sooner you're involved uh, with those creative teams, the directors, DPs, and, and an editor, for us are, are, you know, get that creativity locked in, 
then it becomes more of a technical process of how do you film it on set, you know, and make that as yeah. easy as possible. I think one good follow up question to that that Patrick has is to some degree, can anything change once the biz is like where where is the the creative wiggle room in all this planning? It's I mean that's the that's the the key thing, and it's it's like the more of that creative exploration you can do in previs, the less likely you're going to require to do it on set. You're going to go on to set knowing exactly what you want, but you can still make changes. I mean, working with mocap actors is not going to be the same as working with your live actors. We, you know, so so they're going to have differences, but it's it, they're making changes to something they've already had created by in on as a process, and I think that's the significant change that that, that we feel is meaningful to a production to keep it on track. I could add to that actually. Um, so in Excel, we usually divide our process into visualization and realization where visualization is where we do all this prep and figuring out what kind of shots there are. And then during realization, we just build it to the final quality. But throughout that process, new ideas would always come up. And then we've had many uh, examples and experiences towards the shoot, very close, you realize, oh, we've never realized we need candles here. And suddenly we need that. We quickly take our phone, take, pictures of the candles, do a quick photogrammetry, get it into the scene, populate it, that could happen. On the day of shoot even, sometimes suddenly we want to shoot something completely different in a different section of the environment. We have actually done where we would pull the assets and relay out something brand new just on the day of shoot. So we understand, of course, previous is so to avoid that kind of occasions, but there's no way of controlling that would never happen. So within reason, uh, we do accommodate whatever is asked of us, but we do encourage everyone to spend all the time in previous because those type of shots would always come out looking better. The last minute adjustments on the set to create something just for like a couple of shots, it does happen. It just won't look as good. And there are occasions where you just really can't do it. Then we'll say we can make the changes, but we can come back and do a pickup shoot later on once mm -hmm. we've made those changes. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. worth considering like which shots will be more forgiving too, for instances like that. So uh, long lenses, kind of a shoulder back and forth uh, sequences like that. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty forgiving, but wide establishers where everything's in focus and, and you can see everything crystal clear in the environment that's a little less forgiving so that's the yeah, certain shots have more wiggle room than others for sure i need to uh, i need to i need to uh, make an intervention intervention here yeah, so i just don't want people to think that previs is is gonna you know handcuff you to the very end it's like Again, when it's not VFX, because virtual production is a whole lot more than VF, where you know changing things might be a challenge. But uh, here, most of the time, the director does what he wants within what has been built. Obviously, <laughs> you know, no, no, no different than if you would go and shoot somewhere else. And it's like, well, sorry, pal, we did not build this. That physical set you want to shoot, we didn't build it. So. You may want to shoot it it's just has not been built and we treat this entire thing the exact same way but uh, our experience here is once the dp and the directors are here they actually do what the heck they want and that's the bottom line <laughs> so within that's the bottom line and within obviously the confine of a sandbox we've built but i just want to make sure it's clear it's the same or not same but it's the same sandbox as if we had a budget to physics set and I would want the director to say that you know they're married to a thing called previs which is quite esoteric it's an amazing tool to uh, you know pre-pro to get to the day and be efficient with your time and money and performance and whatever is your storytelling ambitions but it's just just want to uh, make sure that uh, the directors don't think they're married to this thing called well, previs you know well said I've added a few of the people who wanted to come on and ask a question to, to do so. So uh, whoever clicks the button first wins. Uh, go ahead, uh, Nikhili.
Hey folks, uh, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much for this, first of all. Uh, just to follow up on the on the discussion that was happening, um, I was uh, speaking with Felix at Norwell Studios at, at a stage demo in New York City recently, and we were talking a bit about the, um, the decision-making uh, overwhelm that can happen to a director, <laughs> just in terms of like, at least, you know, I come from a filmmaker background. Uh, I'm a virtual production Unreal generalist now, but, um, when you're coming from production, at least you know the kinds of decisions you have to make and what the consequences could be and things like that. But now with virtual production coming in, not really having awareness of you know how long it might take to photogrammetry a particular piece and bring it in and all of those things. How are you finding you know this decision making overwhelm impacting relationships with the director and sort of the idea of like how you can you know manage that? What are, what are some ways you've found that to manage that better? Is, um, oh, go ahead. I, I'm glad to talk to that. Um, so a big, big change. Well, not always a big change, but uh, one thing is also is just keeping dialogues to very direct communication. Um, you know, there's a temptation to wait for decisions to be made with all hand on X departments. Um, you know, if you're doing a big set piece and you had to build it in a traditional way, you're going to need a lot of voices in the room to discuss that, uh, keeping things to the key players can really, really help guiding the director in that. Um, where it may seem like fewer sources of thought in the room, you can get a lot of clarity as to what the team that's actually gonna be providing the answers and the designs and the assets feels capable of and comfortable with. Um, so if they do have concerns about, am I asking for too much, too little, you're wrapping that up pretty quickly. And I do think that speaks to to a lot of things that is, you know, we, we saw a big arms race with, with panels and hardware occur. And now there's a lot of dialogue around content and where these backgrounds are coming from and all that. But the central piece to all of this that really makes the whole industry work is people, you know, very talented operators, very talented artists um, and production folks uh, who make this work. And there can be a lot of nerves involved, which may mean that questions may not be brought up in the moment where they would have been best timed and waiting till on the day to suddenly go, oh, I really wanted this or I really was hoping to see that or how does this impact? Um, you know, some of the dialogues we have, you know, recently was on a shoot where the, the script supervisor, for instance, was very nervous about continuity because of decisions the director was making. And it took one five minute one-on-one -on -one dialogue to appease their nerves. We found a, a way to provide them the information they, they needed and get them the screenshots they needed to feel comfortable documenting things. If we waited until it was, you know, 20 people and we're launching the day, it's not going to be a fruitful dialogue. So really trying to hone those things in. There is a, play, a time and place for those, you know, all hand on deck meetings, but it's not going to be a dialogue. It's not going to be the majority of the dialogues. It can often just lead to a distraction revolving around the technology and also really figuring out what the soft ask is. What are they asking for an artistic component that they have to see? Is it a story beat? They have to see, is it a camera move that, so that it works in the edit? You know, what that is, um, and sometimes that means reading between the lines a little bit, but you don't want to project meaning into it. So actually just straight up asking sometimes, what what are you hoping to execute here? Can mean you might have something in your back pocket that neither of you knew you did. Um, it may be you know, a, a much simpler answer than anybody can anticipate. Um, for us, I think it's just uh, honesty and communication. Our supervisors would have uh, conversations with the director explaining why we couldn't do something or come up with suggestions on alternative solutions. Maybe what you're trying to achieve is actually this. Uh, even though we can't do what you're asking, but we can try these options. Are you okay with that? So I think by sharing that back and forth, they understand we're on the same boat. We are trying our best to give you what you want on the day of shoot. Um, and then if we could do last minute things like the candle situation that I was describing earlier, then we can do it for you. But then not every single occasion will be easily achieved like that. But by just talking them through and giving them all the reasons why it would work and why it doesn't, I think we've been formulating uh, this connection with the filmmaker through the last while to the point that they really depend and trust us on our consultation. And they don't go like, no, 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 I have to have this. Uh, they Because they know that we are trying to get them what they're looking for. But sometimes it's just the technical limitations that we're running into. Yeah. So, the, yeah. 
It's a great topic that it, the entire next panel is about that question, basically. <laughs> so uh, why don't we we cap it there because we have a whole nother hour about basically the communication between the director and the team. Um, Anjali, I do want to get to you. So, um, but thank you, Nikhil. What's your uh, question, Anjali? Well, it actually fell in line with that. So maybe this is a oh. panel, this question <laughs> for the next panel. And it was really from the, the, the kind of perspective of a director. Um, you know, the timelines of creating these worlds are so long compared to a guest director walking in for a couple of weeks on a show. And a lot of things are going to be, you know, set in stone, you know, the Star Trek command center, it's not going to change. Uh, but there are certain strange new worlds or other things that keep on uh, coming up. And I just wondered, like, what's the flexibility and what's the ability to turn around if something's not working, given the timelines of guest directors on shows? Great question. That's where we would um, go with a more of a kit sort of approach and we will build modular pieces so that if you wanted to change your mind, we have prepared and we can rearrange those pieces to create completely different looks with the same kind of um, a theme or like what you're going after. I think more and more we are going towards that approach in preparing the assets and also the material so that everything can be more modular and more uh, procedural so we can accommodate those kind of uh, demands. So if I might say on uh, larger projects like Star Trek Discovery and Strange New Worlds, uh, a senior exec, the showrunner, uh, who has a creative vision and is usually a director of the, uh, uh, the first and the last episode, uh, in our case, it's uh, Olatunde and Sammy, and he is the shepherd of the creative and of those environment designs uh, alongside the production designer from the early, early days. And uh, when the directors come on, they are inheriting a lot, and they have the opportunity to adjust blocking of elements, uh, moving around pieces, but they're essentially... Um, getting a, uh, a finished design, a finished setting that they can approach much like you would a dress set on a location shoot or on a studio set where they're seeing, they'll, they'll have an opportunity to see it uh, during their prep time, you know, a week or two before they shoot it, which isn't a lot, but there's the opportunity to move some items around that specifically affects their blocking or turn items on and off in Unreal is certainly possible and uh, change the physical elements. Awesome, that was a really great thing to cover. Uh, well, we gotta get on to our, our next panel. So I wanna thank everybody, all our guests, Asad, Mujia, Steve, Matt, Richard, Kevin, amazing insights. Thank you to Dylan and, and Andy for being moderators for this great panel. There's a huge amount of amazing stuff. Richard, you win a best Zoom background of the year, I think. Uh, that, was, that was pretty epic. I'm jealous. Uh, yeah, that's pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, you all have a lot of work to do before next year's uh, master class. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to seeing how you all up, uh, Richard. Um, but thank you for that. Um, we are, uh, one thing I wanted to also clarify is that uh, virtual Production House does have studios both in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, and uh, whereas at the beginning we said just Vancouver, just to make that clear, which is a great segue to our next interstitial, uh, which is um, a little sizzle reel of the stuff that Virtual Production House has been up to. And right after that, we're going to be doing our communication panel moderated by Nancy Bassey, who will be talking about all the differences in how to flow communication between all the creatives and these new crew members that are on set that um, everybody now having to discover the right workflow to communicate with. So please stay tuned for that. That'll be our last panel of the day. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Tom. See you. Thanks. Thanks, All everyone. Right. Bye.
I am Ryan Bobkin, and I am the producer of Anna's Hands, a short film shooting at the Virtual Production House. It was our first experience using virtual production. The team from the other end have been supportive throughout the process, really making it integrative and creatively exciting, as well as logistically possible for a small group of young emerging filmmakers, and it's just been an amazing experience to bring our project to life. From the first meeting, they were on board with the vision. They were willing to work within the constraints of a tight, low-budget production. And they set us up to succeed beyond what we thought we were capable of. We did a seven-page uh, car scene that was all at uh, dusk. So this was definitely a choice to come here and do it. For anyone who's interested in the technology and has never used it before, don't be afraid. The team here really walks you through the process and makes it possible and they are really accommodating towards your production's needs. Awesome, that was a really great example of some of the smaller scale uh, VP work that's being done uh, that will be accessible to, to many of us. So now we're gonna head on to our last panel of the day. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Nancy Bassey, who's uh, an incredibly experienced industry executive we've had uh, in this country, and she has a lot of experience in film, TV, commercial industry, physical production, visual effects, animation. She's done it all. Uh, prior to joining Liquid Media Group, which is where she is right now as the director, Nancy was the executive director of the media entertainment uh, for the Vancouver Economic Commission, where she focused on strategic development, advocacy, creative industries, promoting Vancouver as the uh, world-class destination that it is. Uh, but today she's here as our expert to talk about um, all the different communication elements uh, that's going to be happening on set. So good to see you again, Nancy. Uh, hopefully you're there. <laughs> Sorry. <There she> <laughs> um, like, am so, I? <laughs> yes, well, we've had a lot of a lot of questions today about this topic. So it's kind of a perfect uh, end it's to the day. It's perfect. So, I was just watching the last one. I was like, no, 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 that's me. That's me. <laughs> I was there to protect you. Um, all right, well, take it away and uh, and uh, introduce your guests. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm so excited to be here and and seeing how many people are joining us. I I just am so excited about this whole industry and what's happening. It's a perfect kind of mashup, physical uh, production and technology. And um, one thing that was interesting is I I looked up the word communication just to see uh, what popped up and funnily enough it was ways of moving between one place or another and I thought perfect perfect definition for what's the physical production and marrying into the technical side of the production so uh, very excited about that um, today we have uh, pioneers in in this industry and I'd love to introduce them to you and have them say a bit about themselves once we do but first of all I'd like to introduce you to Gladys Tong a visual effects supervisor is she coming on uh, next is Sonia Contreras who is also a VFX uh, sorry VP supervisor and Richard Cormier is the president of creative services for Mel's who was on our last call so um, Richard, you're sticking with it, which is fantastic. We need you. <laughs> hey, Gladys, can you say a bit about yourself? Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm in, the, I'm in a hotel <laughs> in London. So can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, I'm I'll jealous. Show my camera working on my little tablet as I'm traveling. Um, I am in Europe at the moment in a different time zone, so. Bear with me. Um, yes, hi, I'm Gladys Tong, and I am the founder and a president of G Creative Productions. I've been in the film industry for, I won't say exactly how many years, over 20 years is safe, potentially. That's where we um, met. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, recently I was uh, serving as the virtual production uh, supervisor for Pixamundo on the Netflix um, has yet to be released. Mm -hmm. Uh, project, uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, which uh, we spent eight months on the set shooting in Vancouver. Awesome. Richard, can you remind the, the gang if anybody knews in who you are? Uh, hi, I'm Richard Cormier. I'm the uh, Vice President of Mail's Creative Services in uh, Montreal. I've, I've been in the business uh, tad longer than Gladys, just a bit. 
and uh, I've been involved in visual effects and production for uh, for a long time and in uh, product producing live events as well. So that led me to virtual production here at Mills three years ago where we uh, launched the VP uh, stage. Glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you. And Sonia, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, hi, thanks, uh, Nancy. Uh, my name is Sonia Contreras, and I'm a virtual production supervisor with ILM. I've been with ILM for about 14 years, uh, starting out in visual effects uh, post, and then on moving, transitioning over to the world of virtual production um, on season two of Mandalorian. Sort of I've been there, been with virtual production ever since. That's fantastic. Um, so what I love about this group is you have such a varied uh, array of experiences um, from, from all different um, sides of virtual production. Um, so in our last, um, the last panel we were talking, I noticed a lot about uh, virtual production volumes and how they enable filmmakers to be creative. Um, it adds to their toolkit, enables some flexibility and decision-making for the creative process. And of course, none of this can happen without communication between the physical production and the technical onset crews. Um, so my first question to the panel is, um, you know, being that you are pioneers in, in the virtual production space, um, how have you overall bridged the gap in the communication between physical production and virtual production crews? Like, are the rules clear? What are some challenges you've had to overcome? Um, and then do you see a structure emerging, a standard structure emerging, or is it still kind of the Wild West in that, that way? Does anybody want to start? Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so yes, um, I think in the it's every every time every new production is slightly different but generally i found that you know, when you go into an, a new production it's uh almost like the first day of school and you kind of have to uh, establish those relationships and introduce yourself and um and basically establish a clear line of communication clear chain of like who's going to be responsible for this virtual production world at ilm that happens to be the virtual production supervisor that's the main point of contact um, and then uh, working with the other departments becomes a factor of just of um, communicating um, what our virtual production needs are for a shoot day and allowing them to ask a lot of questions as well and um, and just establishing that relationship um, and that's usually the, the, the beginning part of this of the process is just basically making sure that everyone knows who to go to and who to ask questions to and then um, and then from there it, there's a lot of there's you know there's education I think that still need that we're still um, working on um, and like answering questions about what we do and um, and what we can do on the day awesome um, maybe go ahead to, Richard uh, yeah, maybe to add to what Sonia said, which is pretty much that, but it's like, and you're the person that no one ever saw on a set. And you're, you're kind of, it's not stepping on people's toe, it's, it's overlapping, right? Because it's, it's production, so we say VP, but it's, uh, it's lighting, so we interface with grip. It's uh, set building, so we interface with the set builder. We, you know, so we're in the way of everybody. So I think is we need to be uh, sensitive to the fact that a lot of people have to sort of get used to us. Uh, and we're not just one more person on set. We are, in fact, sort of in a, in a leadership decision-making position. Uh, position while we're on set and we do have impact on the outcome of a shot or something like that so um, it's it's been a discovery for us and it's been a discovery for people on set but uh, I think we we recognize that I guess uh, like Sonia said and I'm sure Gladys as well is we know that we have that work to do to uh, understand that we're kind of stepping on some people's toe or, or playing a little bit of their role and uh, we, we work really hard from the get-go to uh, make this education with the people. And on set, well, we make sure that we are uh, right there in the mix with the DP and the director and the first AD, obviously. But, uh, and then uh, quickly, I think it's, it's well established when they see that we move either the set around or the lighting around. We actually do make creative uh, proposition uh, to the director and DP because they don't always know what to do and sometimes they don't even know they can because we've prepped a scene the asset or stuff that they don't even know we have prepared just in case so we we do have the i would say either the power or the liberty 
to propose, which on set is not necessarily always typical to add another person who can have a creative opinion. So uh, that's kind of what is happening in terms of communication. So it's, it is a challenge to uh, insert yourself in that creative logistical mix and creative mix. I think one thing that, um, sorry, Gladys, go ahead. No, no, it was me. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I think one thing to um, to add to that is um, it's important to, um, rather than looking at it from the standpoint of um, stepping on each other's toes, it's important to establish the, uh, the collaboration. Of, in fact, um, within the different departments, we are one of the other departments um, of mm -hmm. that is trying to achieve, we're all trying to achieve the same goal at the end of the day, which is to, you know, to uh, to deliver good pictures um, and um, and help the, the the key creatives achieve their goal. So I think one of the things um, that is really important as part of that communication process is is figuring out how, especially when, as Richard mentioned, when we are in areas that are um, sometimes crossing over, is figuring out how we can work together. And um, sometimes it's, like, for instance, um, when we're lighting with the with the volume, uh, we collaborate with uh, with the gaffer and and. It's it's a uh, in establishing that communication, that rapport, that relationship is uh, is is equally important with us as like as it is with the other departments on set. Great, and Gladys, you, yours was a fairly new set. So did did you have any kind of um, different insights from from your project? Yes, um, uh, on Avatar, uh, we had a very interesting situation of having. Lots of people, uh, crews who had never been on a virtual production set production before. Um, I, I believe it was one of the first in Vancouver. So there wasn't a lot of prep for many of the crews. So we were encountering them on the set uh, for the first time. They were encountering us for the first time. We were encountering them in the respective roles. And adding to um, our other panelists, the virtual production department is new and we haven't standardized this communication flow. This is a really big topic um, for us to, I think, establish this uh, communication, effective communication, where, uh, as Sonia mentioned, I think I, I served as a VP supervisor as well. And ideally, as any other department, you would like to have one person where the communication flows from the onset crew to your team through you. Uh, it's more efficient. It's um, more structured. But I don't think that's been established fully. Um, there's so many components in virtual production. There's the lighting as, uh, you know, uh, gaffers need to talk to our uh, mm -hmm. team. And we have a large team presence uh, on a production. So when they want to ask about one aspect, so grips, lighting, uh, the director, director of photography, sometimes it's a camera crew, there's uh, set dressing. I mean, we're dealing with physical integration integrated with digital. So there's some, um, there's always something tweaking depending on the department that you're having to talk to. All of that has to flow through one person on a chaotic set with a lot of, you know, tensions and deadlines and timing to, to meet and then dealing with the ADs. So I think this is a, a really important thing to, that we should try to standardize. Um, and, and I know it's growing pains right now, but that's uh, the ideal situation for, for a successful shoot. So when you started your shoot and at the end, did you notice a positive change? Like <laughs> were people kind of understanding each other? Just well, yeah. I, mean, I don't know, positive, negative, you, it, it, <laughs> it's a matter of opinion, but we're, there was definitely an organic evolution as everybody started to get used to working inside a volume. I mean, it was really quite interesting to see um, as you know, ADs first time, I think there's a mention about ADs and yeah, we, you know, we are always trying to communicate. I'm sure Sonia and myself being on set and Richard, you, you're, you're trying to bridge the gaps in all of the areas that you can think of, uh, every single day you're on the volume and it's different every day. It's also different for every project. Um, everyone's coming from such a different background in terms of their knowledge and experience in virtual production, but that's really the challenge is, is trying to bridge. All, you have to find out what the gaps are, first of all, because it's varied, and then try to bridge them. So the collaboration, as Sonia mentioned, is extremely key to this mm -hmm. working. 
if I if I may, it's like uh, not to oversimplify this, but it's change. And as we know, for those who've been in this business for more than five minutes, uh, it's always changing. And you'll find uh, two type of people. So the ones who embrace change and understand that we're evolving, actually, it's not even changing, we're evolving uh, at a certain degree, and they will embrace it and they will get behind it. And some people are a bit slower on adopting change or embracing change. So it's, it's kind of a normal thing. I think, again, I, I, I tend to put a lot of this on, uh, I say, our shoulder, either virtual production operator, because I, I think there's something too that needs to be said that, uh, you know, here at Mails anyways, we're both. We're VP operator, we don't do the creative, but we do the creative most of the time, but we, we, we work with any VFX house or any other production company. Uh, but it's changed, and uh, we need to we need just again to be cognizant that it's a bit more on our shoulder to understand that we're changing uh, some some habits that have been there for a long time, and uh, they were fine, they were totally good, but now there's something new that is uh, hopefully helpful for a director or storytelling or to a story. So I think we just need to put more on our shoulder to be sensitive to the fact that it's change. Um, and, and that, I think, helps when we're, when we know, you know, it's like, well, this just changed. So we'll have the excited ones, the not so excited ones, the one that gets it, the one that don't really get it will need a longer ramp up time. So, um, but all in all, uh, you can see that there's a positive, there's a, wall, a willingness to move forward with the current tech available that really comes to support storytelling in a good way. Um, can I add a, a, some of the challenges on a, on a practical level that I just recalled um, about the set? We have a large uh, team uh, that we, we work on the set physically. The volume that I was working on happened to be, you know, uh, Netflix, Pixo and White's uh, collaborative stage that was one of the largest. Um, and it was very challenging to try to cover the real estate alone of fielding the questions that are coming from the ADs. Sometimes you'd have an AD uh, ask you something or, and then the director who's in a different part of the set ask something else. And then our volume controller brain bar uh, in a different section of, this, um, of the studio and some of the uh, other supervisors, whether it was uh, the VisFX supervisors or the gaffers or other crew members would be approaching any member of our virtual production crew, even if we, you know, have established that the virtual production supervisor ideally would be the conduit, it, it's, it's kind of this organic nature of film sets that, you know, when something needs to be done in a hurry, we tend to try to work whoever we see who's closest to us, we might ask them a question. So there's that level of communication flow that um, hasn't been maybe, uh, sort of uh, strictly enforced in virtual production because it's newer that we know in traditional there's a protocol and etiquette on the set that we know very clearly um, who we need to ask for certain things and that's been around forever I just think virtual production is so new that we haven't quite got there yet but I just so I remembered the situation where you know I'm on the stage on the set in the volume and I'm trying to run around fielding the, the, the requests um, in, a, in a certain moment and then finding out that I'm also on the radios communicating with my internal stage team and they've either gotten a separate request or the same request and so the communication flow and you know Sonia I apologize if ILM has a much you know different experience but that was certainly something that I could see uh, on certain days and this was not all the case all the time i just wanted to sort of mention one of those days where you could see communication being a very important topic no, I, and I, I i i fully agree i think i mean obviously and we're talking about now the physicality of a stage it's so it's so large like you can't be in a, you can't be everywhere all the time sometimes it's just you're on one side of the volume that someone's on the other yeah. side your colorist might be on the other side and you can't, then they get asked a, a question. Um, I think 
so one thing to uh, to note here is that virtual production is um, is within itself. It's a department with sub departments, right? We have our mocap team, our operators, our um, our technicians working with camera, etc. And so I think it's equally important that um, the communication within our own virtual production team, for instance, in those scenarios, um, I can't be in two places at once. But if uh, within the team you've established that, okay, like why don't we tag team? You stand next to the visual effects supervisor, I'll stand next to the DP or vice versa. And then we ourselves are also collaborating as a team. Then we can say then, and ultimately, but ultimately it does fall onto some person, in this case, a virtual production supervisor to uh, prioritize the order of things. Some things can go in parallel, as you know, in virtual production, some things need to be queued up. And so it's like, okay, we need to move that light card. And we also need to move that light card, which goes first. And that's the virtual production supervisor's role, right? And so I think in those scenarios, um, we're talking about the, the two, two facets of this communication bubble, right? There's the virtual production and other departments, and then there's that communication within our own virtual production team. Yeah, not to mention when uh, even outside of us, whether it's the AD or the director or the DP, um, even they may have conflicting requests because that happens, <laughs> right? And then they get, and so imagine that. Um, mm -hmm. I said move the light card five degrees to the right or no, no, I meant to the left, the other right. <laughs> um, and then, and then ha imagine having that being propagated into a new department where everybody's trying to please and get things done quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, this is. Uh, but yeah, and and I think it's it's interesting because I've run into the same experience, you know, and especially like you know, you get one request from a visual, uh, visual effects supervisor or another from the DP. But ultimately, then as to your point earlier, um, the I think the, the, the best thing that I found in that is sort of bridging that gap and having them talk, say, okay, mm -hmm. I just received a different re re request because ultimately be among them, one of the two will have, will take priority. And then I, I you know, I find that often I'm having to uh, facilitate that discussion as well as one of the aspects of what what we do too. Yeah, I guess uh, on that, Sonia, it's so the way we, we've done it here, and again, we're learning, so it's not like a, we'll see if we keep the, the, the same pace, but um, we tend to put the tech artists in a position where they're part of the crew and they can actually do whatever they are being asked by anybody if it can be done as quickly as it's being asked. So, and it's free flow. So, and I think the crew has appreciated that because it becomes sort of a Hey, uh, can you move? Uh, can you move this this thing here? And you know, you don't need to go through me to ask somebody to do this. So um, we tried to make this as free flowing as possible. When it comes times to maybe the next layer or next level, I actually either myself or another producer will be uh, straight between the DP and the director just for because of those conflicting messages. So I will I will force or enforce the dialogue and make sure that because as we know if we are pull or, or in a certain direction and then we're switched it, it could have a meaningful impact on how, how long or how much time it takes to uh, set it back um, and then again this is where being part of the process since previous we we actually we know really what's coming we really know what's the goal what what they need to achieve what they thought they want to achieve so it's not like we're we're on set and we're tagging along and so we don't know what's going to be the, the next shot so we have like two tier so the tech artist and our people on the floor will will be like the rest of the crew they will do they'll try to do to give everything they want as quickly as they possibly can and the training with my crew is if you cannot do it in like one minute then you need to come and see me and if you can do it in two within one minute i just, I just don't want to know so because it's about the set designer that wants something somewhere. So it's I'm not going to have a conversation with this person. He knows what he wants and he's going to get it done. So two layer, two level of conversation, one more like uh, critical, make sure we're in sync, high impact on the flow of the set and uh, the rest. Uh, we want to make it uh, as, as cool and simple as possible. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I know I mentioned that there's like the the role of the virtual production supervisor is, is you know to be the point of contact for those issues. But again, it's like I think it's about 
the escalation of those issues um, mm -hmm. when we pair up our teams with uh, with the other departments like our colorists with the gaffer or our technicians with the camera team whatnot is um, is making sure that if issues do come up those are escalated as well so that again that's the within our, our virtual production department so that then in turn uh, the virtual production supervisor can escalate that to the ad and and make decisions accordingly sometimes it could be something as simple as like i've been asked to move this mocap camera that's great you know um but that might impact um, something else that has already has been a request from the dp so um having that flow of communication both within your team and with the other teams is uh, is is it's a constant challenge it's it's a, it's um you know we're constantly uh working and and you know we we do our, we do our best sometimes we might not always get it right we might mm -hmm. make a call once on one setup that wasn't uh you know impacted um you know this uh, this that or something else um and you know we just we're we're all learning, I think, in this way, in, in this uh, world of virtual production, uh, the both working with the teams and and internally, teams are learning. Well, it's interesting because, um, as Gladys mentioned, the set, standardized sets have been going on for you know a hundred years, and now things are changing. So I'd be interested to know about the development of the new language and terms, perhaps, and, and that you know I'm already hearing digital set designer and and virtual art department, things like that. How do you incorporate that into set and, and what language, what are the new languages that we're using that everyone has to kind of learn? Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I feel like we try our best to, to emulate the language of like film as much as possible using terms like flags and light cards and, and things that will but a lot of the times it's um you know we're we're serving as sort of also the translators between that film world and the digital world yeah i think terminology was some a topic that we had touched upon uh, previously about um, standardizing language for effective communication and that's the tricky part not using film language or uh, utilizing analogies that are very much understandable by the traditional techniques. I mean, to be honest, if you're on location, uh, a digital set or an environment could be synonymous with a, a location. It just happens to be made of pixels instead. Um, so the, if you can sort of present uh, digital assets and like props and set dressing, but they just, you just add the word digital in front of it is just the dividing line between the physical and the digital, then hopefully we don't have to use, you know, totally new terms. Um, I think that's more important is to try to make our filmmakers comfortable that it's not completely different than what they know. It's just that it's utilizing a tool set that might be uh, unfamiliar or methodologies that are slightly different, but your craft of filmmaking. And I think what I found interesting is being on a virtual production set made me think of the old school filmmaking techniques because there was a lot of physical kind of cheats that we've, and we're harking back to, you know, the beginning of film. We use techniques that are very analog to bridge this very digital in order to create the illusion. And it, it actually brought it full circle because we are using these, we had to go back to that mentality of uh, early filmmakers. And so trying to bridge our filmmakers with this new technology using traditional thinking of filmmaking is, is so important. Um, I always use the example of, you know, being uh, on a physical location and reminding people that when you're standing on this on this volume that looks like the top of a mountain, for example, in, uh, in outdoor, um, that you're you, you wouldn't do anything different when you're scouting. You, you even though you have you know 270 to 360 degrees of digital environment, you still pick your shots, right? You still pick your um, the, the 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 shots that you want for for the scenes. Um, and if you remind them that that is the case, then it for those of 
for those filmmakers who have a difficult time of embracing virtual production, I think it makes it easier for them because you're just trying to make them feel like this is not a lot different or bring, bring the commonalities to the forefront. And then they don't forget what they're doing in there. Uh, I, I noticed that, that some people forget that they're in the volume. They're either sort of ignore the digital aspect of it or they are intimidated by it and the, the normal filmmaking techniques that we need to remind mm. ourselves are kind of thrown out the window. Lighting is, is a big example of that. Um, so anyway, I, for me, it, it's about, it's our jobs at the beginning of this new uh, tool to try to bring uh, our filmmakers closer to using their, their craft of filmmaking. Um, and we enable that by bridging the gap on, on this stuff that is, is maybe even not even necessary for them to fully grasp. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's not for everybody. It, it really depends on the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So I think the virtual production opens that door to a wide discussion of how you wanna approach making a specific production successful by doing that analysis of who our filmmakers are, what their comfort levels are, what is gonna be effective. Uh, maybe, yeah, so on like communication, we're, we're, it's not just, I guess, finding the proper wording, but it's like how we communicate. And, you know, uh, today I've been on a few panels listening and uh, on one, and it's like, well, we, in terms of communication, I hear a lot, well, here's the limitation, you know, here's the limitation. And it's, I, I find it a bit um, funny because there is limitation but then there's a million things that you could never do on location that uh, virtual production will allow you and it's kind of funny it's like a maybe uh, it's our in our dna we want to almost apologize that it's not limitless <laughs> and it's like oh sorry there's a limit but uh, in fact is uh, i can delete the trees in the back i can i can open the ocean i can and if you go on location, well, good luck, you know. Oh, wow! So that was not stage. <laughs> that was that was not. I, that now. was that <laughs> was <laughs> not stage. I, I, I swear that was not stage. Um, so we need that, to do it. On, therefore, can't you just do it on every show? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the point. That's so funny, guys. Um, so, but but the thing is, so it's not limitless. It's all. It, you know, it's like, hey, can you make it tighter? I, I, you know, the client wants to see more of the ocean as their brand. So it's like, okay, let's do that. It's not a, a big problem. So, I think in terms of communication, there's two things we want. We we were extremely positive on hey listen up try this at home and good luck because it's not going to happen and b uh we're, we're trying to bring back everything to the real physical world so because the rest i think it's a little bit uh it scares a lot of people or scare i'm not sure it's the right word it, it does intimidate so i don't think it scares people it it does intimidate a lot of people they're not in the they were not in the in the digital world they're in the they live in a physical world and we're throwing digital and then previous and stuff like that. And for a lot of people, it's not their thing, except the VFX community, obviously. So communication wise, two things. It's like, hey, let's keep it real. You know, you want to move a plant, move a plant. And uh, we'll, we'll keep it uh, upbeat and up tempo in terms of here's how much more capabilities because then I, we, we, we did that at the beginning and then everybody was focused on the limitation. And he goes like, why is it so weird? We give them the world about the entire world and they focus on the thing we could not give them today. And, uh, and I'll stop. But one last analogy is we did a shoot one day, it was in the backyard of a nice suburb, right? And what would happen if you go and shoot on location? You would put your camera and you would say, shoot, there's a tree. Hmm. And uh, there's no way you're going to cut that tree. This is just not going to happen. You know, you're on location and no one's going to let you cut their 50 year old tree. So you'll put the camera where you can. That's what you'll do. Right. And nobody's going to make a fuss about it. It's just going to be that way. And uh, we are pushing a lot in that direction here. So it's like, listen, I understand, but it is not VFX. And, and guess what? You're lucky. Yes, we can delete the tree. We actually can, so it's your it's a good day. But uh, we want people to think physical location, and then suddenly, uh, virtual production is uh, becomes magical and crazy powerful because there's no way you can have this power on location. 
That's a good point, Richard. I, I just want to jump in there and say that uh, I, I joked around with my stage team um, who were, you know, on certain days were really sweating because people were kept asking us, well, how much longer? How much longer? How long is it going to take? And it would, it would be the same thing as somebody, you know, on the set who's moving a tree, since you used a tree, I'll, I'll use the tree analogy of moving a tree from point A to point B. Um, and this is psychology coming into play, right? Human psychology. Mm -hmm. We see a physical person moving a physical tree and we know uh, what that takes and, and we have a certain amount of tolerance for that. When you're dealing with a computer, uh, digital image or digital tree and the notion is that, oh, you should be able to just click a button and why can't you, you know, just move that tree just like the analogy that they understand in the real world. And sometimes there's more happening that is invisible, which makes it very difficult to communicate. And I think the point of it is that, uh, you know, the psychology is that you don't have the same amount of tolerance for something that you're not seeing because you can't relate to it. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore five seconds uh, for, <laughs> for us, yeah. uh, it could be five minutes for something physical that can be relatable. That's just human psychology. So I think uh, Richard, you did say that, you know, it's up to us to maybe uh, educate or um, help our film community understand the challenges that we're facing. And the communication of that is key so that mm -hmm. it's not a negative when you say limitation. It's not necessarily associated with like, oh, this doesn't work because it takes too mm -hmm. long. But it was because you didn't give us five minutes, you gave us five seconds. And it's an unfair comparison, but yeah. we are dealing with humans and human psychology. So it, I think it is up to us to understand that and deal with that appropriately to uh, help our industry. You um, um, you brought up a really good point about this, uh, the not being able to, like you can't, when you can't see it, it's um, it's sometimes harder to know what to expect as, uh, as opposed to seeing somebody move a, a set piece physically, they know it's gonna take X amount of time, but when they can't see it, it's um it's it's much more difficult and so I think it is it is our 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 job or our role to sort of explain what's actually happening what the challenges are why it's taking uh, one minute and not ten seconds um, I joked with uh or one of the DPs um, recently joked with me was saying um like because he had asked he had several requests that had come through he's like can we do this can we do this and can we do this and I was like absolutely and we we're working on it I was like it's gonna be X amount of time and uh, so he would focus on something else and then he would come back and he was like, well, where are we at in the queue? And it's almost like because he couldn't see what was happening back at the brain bar. He was like, you know what I really want is I want one of those like they have at McDonald's, the, the thing that tells you orders up, this orders up, this orders up. So where, And it's true. It's like the fact that they can't see it. So. And in lieu of that, of that device, um, I think uh, the best thing we can do is just keep them, continue to keep them informed. Oh, we're on number two of the queue. It's going to be another two minutes for number, mm -hmm. till we get to number three, et cetera. And so that's, and, and, and often, that, oftentimes I found that's, that's enough for them to be able to continue because there's so many things that they're working on that um, they'll, they're like, okay, well, let me focus on this other thing and mm -hmm. I'll come back and check on in two minutes. So being, being honest about the timings, being honest about mm -hmm. what's, what uh, what they can what they can expect and how long and also sometimes it's uh, and I heard this in another panel it was um, sometimes just um, trying to figure out um, what the exact goal is of what they're trying to achieve sometimes they'll ask for something because that was the way we achieved it last time and maybe it's like maybe it's moving the tree because he doesn't like it there and maybe it's faster to just move the world right and it's just like and so those kinds of things just trying to uh, figure out why is he trying to move the tree is he trying to move the tree because on this maybe it's a long uh, long lens and we can just move the world slightly and that takes 30 seconds as opposed to and we, we know you know in the scene sometimes I identifying a single tree is very difficult and so um mm -hmm. so those are the challenges and those are the things that oftentimes we have to explain to them saying oh well that particular tree is very it, we're, we're finding it we're locating it um and right, right. Uh, so a, why, not, why are we trying to move it it's not yeah. like click on the picture and hit delete <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah 
w one thing maybe too uh, is, well this is a very interesting topic but in the um, in communication bucket as well what we uh, do from uh, from first day of previous up to the shoot is we actually do create a list of controls that we submit to the entire crew so some so we we make list and sub list so the so the dp says hey here's all the stuff you can change it's all uh, a minute uh, if you want to change the sun from left to right uh, all right that's three minutes so we give them the entire spectrum of controls because that's the deal about vp is like you can create the best world in the world if you show up the day of shoot and you're not prepared to make an intervention on an asset on lighting or whatever then it doesn't actually it's it's a catastrophe because it might look good but you can't it's like you're really stiff asset you can't do anything so, Richard, so what you mean you, you give the mcdonald's menu to them is that what you're saying <laughs> yeah i do i do <laughs> and uh, i really do i really do this is uh this is all you can do this is super fast <clears throat> if you want to do this you we can do this and nobody will notice but you need to call it here because people want something they just forget to call it they call it just too close so and and we do lie because you cannot say it's going to take 20 minutes they're going to kill you if you say 15 they'll look at you with a dirty look <laughs> if you say 10 minutes it's accepted um, no we don't lie but uh, we uh, we do give the list and that makes a big difference and in terms of communication as well not new terms but you know there's the speech in the morning and the briefing from the ed or whoever and uh, we, we let it's like he does his thing and then we we step in and we give them we give the entire crew like hey all right it's cool let's have fun by the way we're not led people and uh, here's what we're going to do and here's how we work together here's the guys you want to touch here's the guys you want to interface and so we we try to like make them welcome because it's weird it's not just a stage it's a vp stage so you're it's not like I'm giving you the keys and you're going to give me the key back at the end of the day. I'm going to be here all day working with you. So we have a pretty big brief in the morning, not big, but a pretty precise brief. And uh, we've seen this as very helpful for first timers, of course, and, 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 and the others as well as a reminder to not kick our OptiTrack tracker. Right. So uh, just a quick question about the virtual art department, because I know they do all the previous months and months ahead of time. So is there a supervisor that comes on set who kind of knows most of the guts or is that still the VP um, that's doing that? Um, I'll take that one. Uh, so the VAD process is usually if, if you have to kind of carve it into stages, uh, the handoff once it goes to the onstage crew, um, a lot of the VAD process should have been completed by then and a lot of the people involved would be would have dropped off because uh, the environment should be finished and you know all the the decisions that were made then um, uh, have been made but of course there's there um, there's a few a key people who would continue that uh, assurance that the decisions that were made during the prep and bad are carried out on stage so there is some connective tissue there, um, but it's a lot smaller a team, and that's my experience. And um, so there are people from the art department, as from the production side, as well as anybody from the virtual production uh, department or the uh, crew that were involved in making sure that they are seeing things go from the very, very beginning, all the way to the to the shoot. So there's definitely connective tissue. Um, but uh, hopefully, a lot of those decisions and in, in VAD are solid and they aren't changing. And um, I think that's the point in, in the previous panel. They talked about how important previs and the earlier, the better, the better decisions, the better the, the experience. And I think that's the key thing. Um, if you want to have a better experience and successful um, in camera vis effects through these. Uh, volume shoots, then I think that that is important Can you to carry that. Yeah. Just, just to build on that, Gladys, because at the Guild, we represent uh, production designers in some provinces. So the production designer would be part of what you're talking about? Like, would the production designer be so. part of the people on set, you know, is asking Absolutely. for a tweet? Yeah. I mean, 100%. I, but I, I don't, I don't want to assume that that has been the case 
uh, from the trial and error of many virtual production shoots thus far. Um, I certainly think that the production designer and their art, art director or supervising art director, somebody from that camp is absolutely involved. Uh, and I mean, it, it, it's still in the shoot phase. I mean, we know a lot of production designers do not continue into vi visual effects, but we are part of the principal photography. So, and our designers are very much, should be very much involved in that because there are, there are changes that ha happen. I mean, logistics change or, you know, some things are exactly uh, how it was planned. Um, so that so that's anyone from that guild. I hope they're hearing that that is my vote anyway. I don't see how yeah. it can't be right. Yeah, that's been our experience. I noticed every show is different. Is that, is it uh, time for questions? Do you think or yeah. uh, diving into people's questions? If anyone wants to raise their hand for your last chance to come on, on camera and be mortalized on the silver screen here. Um, following up on that last question, Heather has an interesting question of just, we haven't really talked much about editorial or the edit, editorial team. Is there any difference in the communication to them? Is there any difference in what they're receiving than just normal production? Is there anything that's the script supervisor's notes to them that's different than they would have otherwise gotten? Not that I know of, uh, it's, it's hopefully, uh, in camera VFX, but if even if it goes to further work later with VFX so on and so forth, it's pretty standard. It's camera shoot, so it's on set shoot. I mean, always if editorial, whenever I'm on a project where editorial is, is very much involved, much earlier, um, it, it's always, uh, always a collaboration that makes it more efficient throughout the entire process. I mean, it, some directors like to in, in involve editorial earlier than others. Um, sometimes editorial is not even set up until afterwards, right? So it, it covers the gamut, but certainly if you're editing, I mean, I think that's true of any part of filmmaking, isn't it? Um, you know, that's, I don't think that's any different. There's yeah. um there's been there's been occasions I think when I mean it's it's a technology so there's it's um it's not without its potential uh, flaws here and there um so there's been uh, there's been occasions where um something uh, maybe the the tree was still moving let's say in that scenario and it hadn't landed before they started rolling so I might flag that to the script supervisor saying hey by the way the first five seconds of the take still had this, this, and the, this and that in the background in case they didn't catch it. Those are the only kind of things I can imagine would be um, the things that would go to editorial via the script supervisor notes. Oh, awesome. I should add, um, yeah. maybe, maybe VizFX editorial might, might play a, a bigger role in this case mm -hmm. uh, on virtual production because editorial um, for VizFX, catching those types of things or yeah, flagging things. Um, yeah, I think that, that might be different. Yeah, there are certain times where um, the tracking data would be sent to editorial or to visual effects because you might actually one of the things that we haven't talked about today is you can actually put a green screen within the frustrum while still yeah. having the environment around the actors to get the lighting and interactive reflections. There you go. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Um, and the camera can then be tracked live and that and that data can be sent to post so that they can then comp in something into the shot, um, which is interesting. All right, let's go to some questions. We've got Eric first. Eric, what's your question? Mic on, Eric, maybe. <laughs> Can't hear you, Eric. If you're uh, maybe you're, you went to go get a cup of tea, Andrea. Why don't you go if, if you're uh, ready to go? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm coming into this workshop. I'm a director, and I have to admit that the type of films that I do, I mean, they're they're usually very intimate, character driven, not you know outlandish scenarios. So, it, like I, I wasn't really coming into this thinking like it was my cup of tea. You know, like it's not, it wouldn't really apply to what I do. I came in because I saw the the uh, virtual production, um, pr the productions that they did last year, and I was you know, I went to the screening and I was blown away, and I was like, oh, that could, that looks like fun. I'd love to try something new. So I came into it thinking like, oh, it'd be kind of fun to do a production like that, but not really thinking that I could could apply it to my own work. 
But then when I saw the interstitial that you guys, that was um, shown right before your panel, and there it was a short film, and I think they were talking about a, a, a car scene. My last film, I actually had a five minute conversation in a car, and it was just so complicated um, to shoot that. You know, we shot it in a car on the street in Mexico City, and it was insane. And, you know, it was very, very, very complicated. But so I'm, I guess overall, my just, my question is just like, I'm, I'm a bit surprised because I also, I also had this idea that this is just kind of like a technology that, yeah, it's really good if you've got, you know, this very crazy, you know, ideas or for safety or for unreal um, atmospheres or whatever, like for those reasons, it seems very logical. But I was, ju I'm just wondering, like in terms even of like, of financially, like, is it something that actually does come into play in smaller productions and that it is worthwhile and it is, you know, that it's just something that that we should start considering a lot more for those types of productions. Yeah, I think yeah. Richard could probably talked to that. His his uh, team was the one that did that, um, that short film. I think to some degree, it's sort of like if you were to rent a stage, you can rent a very small, tiny stage that's built for indie productions that's got, mm -hmm. you know, a few C stands that comes with it, or you can rent a massive stage when you build a hundred foot tall castle. It, there are, there's scales there, but Richard, go ahead. No, no, uh, so, uh, we, well, there's twofold. So other than size, you know, I think the, the size of a volume actually reflects the size of the sandbox you need. So yes, you can perform on a much smaller, you can, you can perform on a much smaller stage, right? This has a pretty decent sandbox where you can walk around. So it's 65 feet diameter, but, you can you can act on, on much smaller and then it goes to uh, what we're trying to do here is to have like more regular uh, regular content that is just normal life like a, a living room or a kitchen or any other scene so i think that's what we're trying to bring to people so if you have a documentary and i think or did we find it we're good i just kind of share super quickly uh it's a test it's not even a real thing that we did for ladies who want to do a documentary uh, about uh, violence done to women over centuries so but it's just a test so it's not uh, real so i think now you full screen. So this is done in virtual production. So didn't put millions of hours on the asset. Uh, this is something we purchased on the marketplace, pretty much free background, fully 3D. And uh, we, we shot this in uh, whatever, few hours. It's a test, so it's not perfect for those who have a scaled eyes, we'll say Ugh, what an asset, but uh, it's a quick, 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 quick test that we did. And it's pretty darn good for a quick, quick test, you know? And uh, if that goes forward, she's gonna finance her movie and we'll be able to talk about this uh, very important topic. But, so I'm showing you this just to uh, basically um, show you that that's normal life. There's nothing crazy, it's just normal life. So yeah. I hope that uh, helps you a bit, Andrea. I think one of the common misconceptions is that it's um, the the volume work is just for those large uh, features, like sci-fi and whatnot. And while there are benefits to doing that type of work, um, there's you can get a lot of wins out of just doing you know process work. And um, and as Richard's showing, like um, small environments, dialogue is often you know because then you don't have to invest as much time on the environment. You you know um, you, you can, interiors are actually quite good too. Um, so there's and the scalability of the volume size, like the different volumes that exist doesn't necessarily have, you know, have to be the large volume that you're using. Um, it can be a smaller, a smaller volume. It's, it's really just about what's the best fit for that production. I'll also add that I think this is a tool that um, could also create uh, opportunities for any filmmaker, indie or otherwise, um, some creative usage of this technology, uh, not just about environments being otherworldly, um, like they have to be sci-fi environments, but just even how we use the camera and how we track the camera and how we play with the technology. I think my goal anyway is to open that door wide open for creative use cases that we haven't even seen before. 
we haven't even, I don't think we've even scratched the surface yet of what is possible. I mean, it's, it's, the first step is just to get used to this technology, find out, you know, we're trying to learn about it. How much does it cost? So how big do they have to be? You know, what are the volumes in our local cities that we can, we can shoot in? That's just the very beginning and the foundation. But the tools themselves, like the software alone, the change from version to version of software development and tools, it's, it's phenomenal. And uh, I don't even want to bring it up, but I will. The use of potential AI integration into our creative process. How, you know, this isn't just a tool that has a limit. Um, I think it's, it, we haven't even explored where those boundaries are yet. Yeah, we did a lot of interesting stuff on the shoot we did last year um, with Pixo, where because the directors were creating one page scripts for the wall that didn't need to be commercial, there was a lot of creative stuff. You know, uh, Andrea probably saw those films where the act, you know, in the scene, they're brainstorming. If they're live brainstorming and the Eiffel Tower is appearing and disappearing and another character, when she she got dizzy, the entire environment spun around her as she was spinning and it went, or another film, when two characters touched hands, the castle behind them exploded, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in flames uh, to show their love. You know, the, those are all types of, you know, pretty um, creative stuff that can start to come out or turning the background black and white. Um, there was a lot of interesting stuff. Thank you, Andrea. Great question. We have three more I want to get to. Eric, I don't know if you're with us yet. If you are, go ahead. Not yet. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's go it's with uh, be a great question when you get there. Uh, let's go to Nikhil. Hey, I think you're calling me, Nikhil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this, folks. Uh, for context, I'm a writer, filmmaker. Um, I'm, I've studied Unreal and I'm training to be. Um, I'm training in virtual production. So thank you for the conversation around flexibility and communication and set and preparation. But I'd like to know what are the top three things you would do to prep a Unreal Engine level for a director's needs, regardless of whether the director anticipated it, whether that came up in previous or not, you know, whether they were aware they would need it. Like what are those top three things you would always do to a level? I mean, optimization would be one. But I'm just curious to know if there's some specific things that you always do, like have a day and night lighting scenario or something like that. I'm just curious to know if there's anything like that. Thank you. Who wants to? Well, it's a fine. Well, I think it's sort of simple and complicated, it's simple. So, you know, the way we're going to prep an asset is, a, you know, there is a dependency on budget, you know. So we can spend an hour to give you the flexibility on an asset, or we can spend five days uh, building all those handles where you can change the time of day or the lighting or moving every single asset and so on and so forth. So it does uh, vary. But I, for us, the general guideline is, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to bring that to if you were on a physical set, uh, you, you definitely need all those handles, at least, at the very least. So we will put that in place uh, together. And, and I, that's you know, the most simple way I can say we, it's how we approach it. And after that, you can do a bunch of other things. But I think the pragmatic thing is we need to make sure that this set, that digital set is, is ready to be uh, interact with, which is no different than if it was in a physical location. So that's kind of our default starting point. It's a tough question to answer because I think every director will have uh, slightly, or different, every project actually will have different parameters, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of things that I'm quite conservative. I always try to over-prepare because I don't want to get yelled at on set. Um, so usually if it's, a, if, if it's picked angles, for example, in an environment that they've picked up a certain, um, lens and a, a certain uh, direction, I think I would always give extra, you know, you always do a little bit of extra. Uh, you, you'd find out what those trigger points for that particular director would be. Um, like they love to, you know, change uh, lighting and, that, and, and that's not for everybody because usually you want to be set on the lighting because it has so much implication for everything else on the set. Um, 
but anything that you would try to research about the particular project, what you can accomplish in the time and budget that you would uh, offer up as, as options on the day. You, you're always thinking that way. I'm not sure what the top three are because they probably would change depending on each project, which is a, a cop-out answer, but I'm not sure if, if any of the other panelists have a better idea. No, I, I agree with you, Gladys. I think it's it's a it's hard to find a top three because it's dependent on it's dependent on the environment. It's like the, the location, the digital location. It's dependent mm -hmm. on the, the particular DP or director. Um, and um, it's depend, it also depends on what the scene is that we're trying to achieve. So if it's like, but like, for instance, in that case, again, you're going back to the example you're talking about the tree, like, if we know that there's going to be some some trees that we're going to be shooting towards, I might prepare some, um, you know, uh, like some locators of, of type sort to be or 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 arrange the level in a way that is that makes it easy to select those trees because you know you're going to be asked to move them right or left um on on you know to for a particular shot so but it does depend i think it's, it's very it's it's very dependent on the specific the specific load the specific um directors and uh and what we're shooting the scenes yeah, optimization is not something that is even um, debatable. It's not a top three. It's a must. So um, right. it's just re referencing the, uh, the the optimization that is just part of uh, your must do list. Um, I think just giving bookends to things that you know the director is asking for, you know, uh, giving options that are already optimized that you can offer on the day is probably the best overall answer mm -hmm. to that. Awesome. We have one last question from Syed. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, panelists. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the wonderful section. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, 3 a.m. in India. I'm, I'm, I'm from India, basically. And also, I'm, I'm you know, on my toes uh, listening to all the panelists. It's a wonderful session. Uh, uh, I have a question, uh, which which uh, uh, I would like to ask. Like, uh, what are the criteria that you, as a technicians and as, as a production guys, look when you when you are putting up the screen? Like, so they like the screens LEDs should be from the same batch. Just for an example, so what kind of criteria you look? when it comes to purchasing of a screen second thing uh, i would like to uh, ask is what future you look in the film industry we are talking about all the uh, you know fictional films uh, or the science fi uh, fiction films right now but what about the theaters what about the uh, the documentaries kind of uh, thing can can those uh, uh, be taken into the virtual production side and if not why if yes how we can dealt with it yeah thank you so much so kind of you thank you yeah. so on the first question was sort of just about the considerations that go into building the the um, the space, which we had a, a panel a little earlier about some of the technical aspects of that, but is there anything that any of you want to um, talk about the, the building of it, and then we'll get into the creative. That's a, that's a very long and it's a good question, uh, but uh, that's going to be a very, very long answer. But uh, Syed, uh, there is a lot of consideration uh, size for sure, because we'll have a direct impact on your budget. And then uh, consider the latest and greatest technology uh, that is currently available um, and pixel pitch and so on and so forth. So. I don't know how to answer this. It's it's like it's not a, it's not a short answer. I know how to answer this. It's just not a short answer. There's a lot that needs to be considered, and uh, there's plenty you can find online or around the world that will give you example. For the time being, uh, most of the sets around the world uh, are pretty close to each other in terms of uh, the technology they have selected. And then, uh, you know, Row is a very popular brand and because they have a pixel pitch that people 
uh, understand is good uh, for VPs, 2.8 millimeter and so on and so forth, so Brompton. So it's really a hardware technical question. And if you go online, you'll see that most of the big stage have pretty much the sort of same tech. So I hope that answers a bit, Sayed. Well, that's what I can offer. Awesome. And then his last question was just, oh yeah, Gladys, if you want to go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Yep. Uh, just about, I think we talked a little bit about it earlier, but just are there other productions than sci-fi stuff that can be used? Is there any other additional stuff you guys want to talk about? Uh, in relation to the other types of uses? Like, oh, there was one question potentially, Richard, that you could answer about the short that, that, that was shown. It seemed like that was real footage, not, not unreal. Was, yeah, so that was all in camera. We see this growing at lightning speed. We, we can see it, especially with what uh, the new tech is coming. I don't want to say AI, it's just such a small two letters, but so deep of consequences, but Bottom line, there's a, a ton, a ton of materials coming online or available that is uh, anywhere between cheap or very affordable. So that's going to actually have impact, as you saw, in this very simple storytelling, uh, not VFX at all. Um, maybe one word, if it's for as a volume, we here at Mouse use it uh, in 60 different five ways. You know, we, we do television, we do, we do music videos, we did commercial, we do movie, we do a bit of fact. So a volume is a very, very, very flexible tool. And if I may, I'd like to show you a clip that is like 15 seconds. And I'm going to I'm going to set it up. So usually I show stuff and I explain to it, but it's VP today. So uh, and I think it's going to probably help Sayed as well. So what we're about to see is Simon, the guy who's been operating all day. We did a test. Uh, we did a test a few a few weeks ago, and it's a tornado. And it's just a video playback plate come out coming out of YouTube, by the way. And this was shot in basically uh, real time. So you can have a pretty fancy uh, sort of VFX shot uh, that we, and you see the making of as you see. Uh, and, and again, it's a test, so we didn't go crazy. There's no debris, there's no water, blah, 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 blah. But um, the point is, you know, for us, when, when we say, hey, for directors, I don't think you would have put necessarily uh, a tornado in your script because uh, you're on a tight budget. And uh, you you couldn't just couldn't put that in. So well, this is a thirty minute shot, and so and I and I and there's something we have not talked, which is something I talk more to producers usually. It's the logistics, you know. So and, and I'll I'll stop after this. But it's like when we look at making a movie, it's not linear, but it's really it's it's a kind of linear. So what we say is you can have a bunch of shots in your 40 day shoot or 30 day shoot that don't look necessarily normal to you like hey in front of a store on the street a car scene a tornado scene a regular scene a kitchen scene and they're spread throughout your script but you can take all those little sequences and you can pack them really nicely and come and go in virtual production and shoot all those disparate shots in one day. You can be a day, you know, during at 9 a.m., you can shoot your night shot. That's not a problem. And your day shot five seconds later and you're outdoor and you're indoor. So I think, you, you know, for against the, the benefit of storytelling and directors is like, well, think of your logistics and, and how you do your filmmaking a bit differently. And then you'll you'll find out that you can actually uh, count on and afford virtual production because one thing that has not been discussed, I don't know if it's another topic, but it's like, well, it does cost money. So it does, it's not free. And <clears throat> there's the, the whole concept, uh, practical concept of cost displacement. So you're saving a lot here and you need to build your tab of saving and then say, I'll take all those savings and I'm going to do this in virtual production. And usually, technically, you should come out good. That's my, awesome. that's, that's my last word. Well, thank you guys. We're, we're 10 minutes over. We had 10 minutes of bonus content there. So I hope uh, it was awesome. We got to see a tornado. No one was expecting that. <laughs> um, well, a huge thank you uh, to Gladys, Richard, 
Sonia, and of course, Nancy for moderating this panel. Was, that was one of my favorites to really hear. You really get a sense of how this is an emerging frontier that needs a lot of these types of conversations to kind of standardize, which is really exciting to have you guys here and very thankful that we can be sort of this one of the two places where that conversation is happening. Uh, so thank you guys very much. Um, just before we wrap up here, a little bit of house cleaning things for me to go through, but thank you guys. You can thank, go, you. Yeah, thank you. Relax. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, we're just going to go over the, the, the things for tomorrow. So Julian, you can put up the slides for uh, tomorrow's panels. Uh, we're doing, um, we're starting at the same time again tomorrow, uh, which is uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we'll be looking at a case study um, of a show called Bucketheads, which was a sort of Star Wars fan film that used uh, virtual production. And they've been working on it for about five years. There's a lot of details of highs and lows and learning lessons that we're going to get right from them. Then uh, a little bit later, uh, we have Meet the Studios, where we have all the different vendors from across the country, sort of a cross-country checkup where we're going to be able to hear a lot of the specifics about their stages. So if you're someone who's looking at shooting anywhere in Canada, uh, we basically have all the people to talk to there. Then a little bit later, we have the best uses of VP, which will be a really interesting panel all about um, the different ways of using it, doing car shots, doing uh, full 3D environments, using actual live footage, using two, two and a half D footage, all the different specifics of how that stuff works. Uh, will be covered in that one. And then the last panel, we'll be talking a lot about car comps because car comps, I think, uh, as a lot of us were talking about earlier today, shooting a car on the on an actual road it can, can be really painful uh, for trying to communicate to the actors. It can be really slow. Um, and there's a lot of stages that are set up just for car comps um, where basically you get the reflections on the windows and in the rear view mirror and all that type of stuff. Uh, and you can do many different types of day, um, like the short film they were just showing. So we're just going to do an entire case study on that type of stuff. So please make sure to, to join tomorrow. A few other things before we, we say goodbye. Um, all the today and tomorrow will, uh, is being recorded and will be made available on the DGC's uh, YouTube page. So you'll be able to, um, if you miss any of these, you'll be able to join there. You won't be able to participate live, but you will be able to watch it later or share it with other people. As I mentioned earlier today, um, we uh, have a little Google form you can uh, sign out, which I just posted in the chat again. Uh, that's if you are interested in potentially being involved in some of our in-person workshops that we'll be doing throughout the year. Um, we basically do these workshops where we shoot eight short films with eight directors in two days. Um, and the purpose there is to get real world hands-on experience. Um, and we're currently looking at potentially doing them in Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto. So if you're interested in potentially being involved in that, um, please fill out that form. Other places you can hear some of the amazing masterclass work that we've been doing. We have the DGC podcast where we rebroadcast re a lot of the um, events that we do across the country. You also have the DGC YouTube page, which has a lot of the other masterclasses that we've done that are public. Uh, if you're a DGC member, we have a lot of private masterclasses that we do and workshops ranging from all sorts of different topics around directing for television, uh, MOW directing, independent, independent film directing, how to pitch and sell, all that type of stuff. So if you're not a DGC member, you're, you're, you're missing out. Uh, and lastly, I just wanna give a huge thank you to everyone who's been making this possible today and tomorrow. We have a huge team of people that have been working very hard to, to, to bring this to you, our speakers, our moderators um, that have been working very hard for this. I'd love to thank Pixamundo, William F. Whites, Mel's, the Virtual Production House, both in Toronto and Vancouver, um, ILM, Versatile, Dark Slope, um, all these vendors have come out to give you guys a bunch of knowledge. So a huge thank you to them. Uh, thank you to our, our keynote speaker, Ivan Hayden, uh, for kicking everything off and all the other moderators. A big thank you to the DGC National Executive Director, Dave Bourget who helps uh, the trains run on time over at the DGC. Warren Sonoda, our national president, who kicked things off this morning for uh, his support. Hans Engel, who is my right-hand man here at the National Directors Division, keeping everything moving and working. Uh, and then we have a lot of other um, team members. Uh, we'll just go through Julian Lung, who's been massively helpful, <laughs> helpful today. 
with the slides and making sure all of you are, uh, are able to get in. We have um, Aaron Muslam and Amber Orchard who will be helping with our virtual production workshops in Vancouver. Uh, Marie Jose, uh, who's helping, uh, and, and Brandon St. Jacques, who are helping with our Montreal in person event. And Kim and Kent Robinson, who've helped immensely plan today, as well as our Toronto events. So, huge thank you to all those people. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Uh, we 